and attendees. I extend all prisoners. My name is Lisa Boynt and Museum of the University of Wrocław. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome you at the first day of the annual meeting Universums in Wrocław. I would like to kindly ask the rector of the University of Wrocław, Professor Robert Olkiewicz, for official open the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the authorities of an, and the entire academic community of the University of Wrocław, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all participants of the European Congress of University Museums. In the most beautiful hall of our university, the Baroque Leopoldina Hall. <coughs> of the first higher education institution in the capital of Silesia, founded by Emperor Leopold I of the Habsburg dynasty. Our university, established in uh, 1702 as a Jesuit academy, was transformed into a Prussian state university in eight, eight, 1811 becoming known as the Frederick William University of Silesia. In uh, 1945, after the fall of the Third Reich, it resumed its activities as a Polish state university and its first lecturers were prominent professors of the pre-war Jan Kazimierz University of Lviv. Therefore, our university cherishes both traditions of Wrocław, <coughs> tradition of um, Austrian and Prussian provenience, and the Lviv tradition. The main guardian of our academic traditions is the Museum of the University of Wrocław. So we are pleased that you have chosen our institution <coughs> as the place for your meeting. We have enshrined its important role in the life of the university in the new statue of the University of Wrocław. We are pleased that the museum is increasing popular with visitors, increasingly popular with visitors, and its new exhibitions equipped with carefully prepared catalogs are of great cognitive value. Life around us is moving very fast. This feeling is the result of globalization, overwhelming news, media, internet, and more recently, artificial intelligence. It's good that we sometimes manage to slow down for the while to stop our tracks. As the popularity statistics show, for instance, in the case of the events such as the long night of the museums, we need a brother. It is given to us by our heritage, which we can show to future gener generations thanks to museums. Without a moment to reflect on what was and how it was, it is difficult to find ourselves now. The present brings us into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have come together at the University of Wrocław to reflect on academic heritage and the opportunities and obstacles to realizing the full potential of university museum collections. This is the challenge of our future. This is a tough task in today's fast-paced world. I wish you a fruitful discussions and the development of modern solution to cherish our past. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the opening speech. I would like to add that the rector of the University of Wrocław agreed to take whole event under his patronage, for which we are very grateful. Now I would like to present you a recorded uh, video from uh, Mr. Sebastian Sugarian, uh, president of the uh, European uh, Academic Heritage Network Universeum, but I don't know if we are able to do it because of the technical problems with voice. I asked my colleagues, no, it's not possible. So I would like to ask the Vice President of the European Academic Heritage Network Universeum, Mrs. Esther Boulez, for introduction to the conference. The floor is yours. I hope you can see me. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm actually standing on my toes. Um, welcome. I am meeting wonderful and find another European city to be cover. Unfortunately, our president, our beloved president, Sebastian, isn't here today. I really, really hope the technical uh, problems will be solved later on so you can see his message, which he prepared for you. Um, I think, um, I hope you will all have a really wonderful uh, conference. And I'm also really happy to uh, say that Marta Lorenzo will do the, have, uh, make the keynote speech later on and she's also a former board member of Universeum. So, uh, and also Marlene Mulio who's over here, who's also a former board member, and Roland with you. Um, so, somehow there is still a big part of Universeum heritage as well <laughs> today. Um, for now, uh, I just wish you a really, really wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Rector, for opening this uh, wonderful um, event. And uh, well, I just really hope that Sebastian will be able to give his speech um, later on. Thank you. Have a nice. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to the president of the Polish Association of University Museums. Professor Hubert Kowalski, who is also co-organizer of the conference. Good morning. Uh, I can see how many of us are here in this interior, spectacular. So it means that the, the engagement is on a high level. I hope this uh, conference will be another success, as usual with the Universeum. This, is, this time this is combined conference with our academic association of museums in Poland. Uh, Mr. Rector, thank you for hosting us here. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, I'll, I'll say thank you also to, to the Ministry of Education and Science because thanks to this ministry, we can uh, manage to do everything during this conference on such a high level. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Director Beata Pukas Turek, thank you very much for your support and that you are here, really. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure this will be a spectacular uh, couple of days, and I'm also sure that uh, still we've got uh, a lot of work to do concerning our collections. Uh, especially that uh, the war, uh, uh, which is still here, I'm afraid, and nothing changed. We talked about it one year ago. So I think that the research and managing of our collection is still a crucial uh, thing, and we really should focus on that. And 
I wish you a very pleasant time here in Wrocław. You will see how beautiful the city is and have fun. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. From this place, on behalf of my friends from University Museums in Wrocław, I would like to thank presidents of the Universeum and uh, the Association of University Museums for large contribution in arrangement of the conference in Wrocław. It was our dream to organize such a big event for museal workers and the dreams come true. We appreciate it very much. Now I would like to introduce the keynote speaker, Mrs. Marta C. Lorenzo, researcher at the University in Lisbon and director of the National Museum of Natural History and Science. The floor is yours. bother you much. <coughs> oh, <laughs> there's no place to put legs. Right. This one. Okay, can you hear me? Hello. Dear Mr. Rector, uh, dear President of the Polish Association of University Museums, dear remotely, Sebastian Subira, my dear friend. Dear friends, colleagues, it's really a joy to be here today uh, at the beautiful University of Wrocław in Poland. I'm very grateful to the invitation uh, coming from an association that both, but more universal, that really means so much to me and that I love so much. The last time I was in Poland, for a Universeum meeting was in 2007. Jagiellonian University of Krakow. And it was a very important turning point for Universeum. Because Universeum was created in 2000, but it had been fighting these internal tensions between formalizing an association and remaining informal. And in 2007 was the year where we really thought we must get ourselves organized. Because there were very, very few people in Collegium Maius, um, not like today, here. And um, it was, we used to joke that it was the meeting of the taxi because everyone, all the participants could fit in a taxi. Fortunately, that was really uh, a, a moment of reflection and we went back and decided to formalize the association, which we did in Uppsala, 2009. There she is in Marie Munktel. She, she hosted us at the Gustavianum and 
we created the association, which, is, which exists now you know, in such a healthy and interesting way. I've been reflecting a lot about how we have been organizing ourselves and the impact these organizations, these networks, have been having on the way we do things. I will share a few ideas with you. It will be wonderful to have your feedback during the day today. And although I'm mindful that each case is a different case, and there are extremely important local granularities to consider, that's a fashion word nowadays, I really wanted to generalize and address big questions today. Like, where are we now? Which forces, tendencies, internal, external, brought us here? Are we better than we were 20 years ago? More than 20, almost 25 years ago. If you take a walk from the Basilica di Santo Antonio to the Cappella del Scrovegni, through the city center of Padova, you will come across a 16th, rather indistinct 16th century palazzo. It's called Palazzo Bo, and it belongs to the University of Padova. Once you go inside and pass through the lovely but very austere courtyard, turn left and then right and then go up some stairs, you will find the oldest anatomical theater in the world. It was commissioned by Girolamo Fabrici d'Acquapente and remained in use from 1595 to 1872. For those of you who have not been there, who has been there? Raise hands. Still, there's lots of people who have not been there, so I'll try to describe. It's quite difficult to describe what it is to be there. It's like being in a tiny room with an inverted wooden cone hanging from the ceiling. The tip of the cone was cut to precisely match the length and width of a human body lying flat. You barely fit in there. And looking up, you can see the balustrade where medical students once stood attentively observing the hands of the professor. The teatro stands as a unique testimony of Western teaching practices of medicine of the past and of the present. Like so many other historical sites of science, the extraordinary chemistry laboratories of the universities of Porto, Coimbra, and Lisbon in my own country come to mind, its survival to our own time results from prolonged cycles of use for teaching and research. Use prevented replacement, and therefore use remains embodied in its materiality. I visited the Teatro Anatomic for the first time with Sophia Talas and Stephen de Klerk exactly 20 years ago. It was one of my first encounters with the creme de la creme of university heritage in Europe. I never stopped visiting, studying, and being amazed by what I saw, like I am here today in Wroclaw. In Padova, Naples, Tartu, Krakow, Trondheim, Tokyo, Salvador da Bahia, and so many other universities, these encounters have irreversibly shaped the way I see museums and especially the way I see the cultural role of universities in present-day societies. Despite their immense heterogeneity and diversity, university museums and collections share this unique ability to tell stories about our quest for answers, about nature, the universe, and ourselves as humans, a quest that is as ancient as it is contemporary. That is why many university collections seem recent, even when they are old, 
and vice versa. Today, the Teatro Anatomic offers guided tours twice a day, but 20 years ago, it was one of Padua's best kept secrets and mentioned in city guides and devoid of street signs, visitors had to know of its existence beforehand. Otherwise, you would not go inside the Palazzo Bo. It would not be natural to go in. This invisibility of university historic sites, museums, and collections was widespread in Europe at that time, resulting from a combination of lack of awareness and recognition, lack of resources, and in many cases, indifference and neglect. Undoubtedly, a lot remains to be done. Numerous secrets remain concealed. Many collections are still in boxes, and far too many doors remain closed. Resources remain scarce. Identity crises also remain. Just the word university poses considerable barriers for many people who do not feel entitled or authorized to enter. However, we have come a long way in the past two decades. We are so much better now. Now let's go to the more positive part of money. Okay, examples of things that are unlikely to happen today and happened 20 years ago. Rectors saying that museums are not a concern of universities. We are not in the business of museums, as one told me once. Very little, very little literature or organized information about university museums and collections. University websites were a desert in terms of museums, collections, and heritage. Rectors opening UMAC and Universeo meetings did not happen, very, very rarely. Collections orphaned and abandoned, zero staff in many of them, being at best transferred to other museums or at worst being sold, for example, in the US in American uh, universities, or trashed at massive scale. I have this example, which I saw photos, but I never really uh, wrote anywhere, of, in Europe, petrology collections being sold to build asphalt of roads. Being sold to build asphalt. Um, it would be actually be important to do some research about how much got lost in the past 30 years or so in Europe, in European universities, since the 1990s. The precise point in time when the tide began to turn for university museums is difficult to pinpoint. Each university has its own recovery story to be researched and told in the future. However, one thing is certain. No recovery could have been achieved without the countless professors, researchers, students, technicians, and general staff who day after day defended their collections and museums, explaining their meaning and value ad eternum, protecting them with dedication and sometimes with great imagination and personal sacrifice against everyone, colleagues, administrations, head of departments, deans, politicians, and so on. They did this individually and at some point collectively. It's the collective that I want now to focus on. So if we look back at the way we got organized, we see what I would call two, uh, two waves of um, networks, so to speak. Between the 1990s and roughly 2010s, you have national, regional, and international networks, mostly. And since the 2010s, 
there has been an incredible growth, explosion in some countries even, of local networks per university. So all, uni all museums, collections, sometimes libraries, archives coming together in the same university. You've been, we've been seeing that. So these are different, substantial different moments and sub substantial different agendas for our community. In some sense, opposite agendas. Let me explain. Since the 1990s, we have seen national networks of university museum professionals, for example, in Australia, UK, Scotland, Germany, Brazil, the Netherlands, USA, UK, Mexico, Cuba, Poland, Japan, China, Peru, Chile, and many other countries, okay? The International Council of Museums was created, recognized the distinct nature of university museums and created UMAC in 2001. So that's an in the first, well, it's not the first, but it's the, the global international, the largest international network. Of course, Universeum was created in 2000. There was this problem, formal, informal, formal, informal, and then in 2010, actually, I, I said wrong, I said 2009, but it was 2010. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. This first wave of networks had mostly three objectives. There was a sense of emergency, that a lot was being lost, that there was this neglect, this idea that Nobody care that things were closed, that things were inaccessible, that degradation was rampant. And so one of the objectives of these early networks was really to raise awareness for a situation that was becoming catastrophic of vulnerability and risk. On the other hand, it also wanted to mobilize the museum sector and in, to a large extent the culture sector to us as professionals and to university heritage as part of cultural heritage. So it was, in fact, it's more or less the same into in late 1990s that you hear first about university heritage as such. Um, so it's an outwards movement. There was not a lot of people. Let's mobilize. Let's get together. Let's organize nationally or internationally for this recognition of the sector that is outside us. Centrifugus. I don't know if this is the term. Centrifugus forces? Who is the physicist here? Centrifugus. I don't know. Centripetus. <laughs> okay, but you understand, driving out, driving in. So this is out, outward. The some of the achievements is, well, first of all, the recognition of ICOM, which was not at all easy. There was lots of uh, discussions. The recognition of the Council of Europe, which we, we kind of forget, but it was very important in 2005 the recommendation of the Committee of Ministers about university heritage in Europe. Also, a little bit later, the, the German document, the research infrastructures in 2011. Of course, many surveys, UK, Holland. UNESCO started in 1987, recognizing the value of universities as World Heritage, so the first was Charlottesville, Monticello in 1987, but then University of Padua, Botanic Garden, 1997. So there's this movement of recognition of university heritage, but precipitated, pre accelerated by professionals, by people who were inside the university. The second wave is rather the opposite, is 
internally. In order to have an internal network of museums, collections, eventually archives and libraries, so this varies a lot, but you need to have some degree of work, internal organization. First, you have to have people. You have to have recognition by the university of these units, museums, collections, and so on. And um, you need professionals. Before, you didn't have professionals sometimes. So you need, you need some conditions. It's more difficult to create a network inside the university, to coordinate programs, to coordinate um, advocacy, management. So they are more recent. This in general. I told you I wanted to do general, you know, big questions. If we exclude Italy, uh, which had local networks per university in 2002, but not because the professionals wanted, because the rectors united and said, okay, now we're going to have a network per university in every Italian university. But except if we exclude Italy, we only have uh, local networks in the past five to ten years, maximum. These networks, internal, whether formal or informal, so this varies a bit, are also a main force driving change in universities. They are not reactive. See what I mean? Like the earlier one, uh, earliest ones, they were reacting to an emergency, so something that we needed to solve. They are active. We don't want to organize ourselves in networks because we need to defend something. We organize ourselves because we want to act. We have important things to do together and we want to have a voice in the university and beyond the university. So achievements, incredible body of literature, of course many policies, the number of policies uh, for heritage, for museums, that exist per universities is incredible compared with, uh, I don't know, five years or ten years. Of course, new projects, new museums, new approaches, more sustainable funding, and there's so many, there are too many to enumerate here. Some will be presenting, but the quality and the number of new university museums in Europe is spectacular. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, many are innov very innovative museums, very museums that are leading the way in terms of the cultural sector and the museum sector. In a way, University Museums 2.0, 2.0, looked at the museum sector, picked the very best, and made meaningful university-centered synthesis. So things that we achieved also is the incredible document by the, inter uh, the European University Association, is Universities Without Walls, that explicitly mentioned for the first time a document from 2021 that explicitly mentions for the first time uh, museums and the importance of museums and collections in the European landscape of higher education. The university is a place where culture is created, performed, I'm quoting, performed, exhibited, spread and discussed. Of course, and to conclude, problems that remain. I think there are three, three important problems that uh, we need to address in coming years. Not that I want to create some agenda, but it's from my reflection. One is that although we've come a long way, the situation is incredibly volatile. See what I mean? In 24 hours, everything can change or can change. And this, volatile, this volatility, institutional volatility, de depends on two tensions, 
that are present in the university every day and that we feel these tensions every day. The first is the tension between the past and the future. In other words, the university loves the past, the glorifying, you know, the past, their history. And they project themselves, like here, 500 years and so on. Every university likes to project an image, a reputation of being old. But at the same time, there is a tension with, we don't want anything to be with old. We don't want anything. Uh, we're about the future. A university is about the future. So there's this tension that's very visible in everything we do. And we need to harness. The second tension is the macro and micro level. So the university is a very stable institution, thousand-year-old institution, at macro level. University, director, and so on. You know, it, hasn't, it has not changed. It's been the same for centuries and centuries at macro level. At micro level, at the level of departments, labs, institutes, and so on, it changes enormously. So it's very much like this table looks very stable, and it is. But if you look to the atoms, into the atoms, and you know, the electrons, and so on, it's like chaos. And so there's this tension between macro and micro, past and future. And the real question for us is how do we fit here? More than fit, how do we help the university solve these tensions? I think it's interesting to raise that question. Another thing that we need to do is uh, the continue leading in the, all the dimensions of decolonization. It's a different problem, but we need to be leading. We are leading in Europe. And some of the people here have incredible experiences to say. We have the freedom. The universities have the freedom to do, do the reflection, the, the critical analysis, and the means, the political means, to lead in terms of restitution, much more than municipal city museums and so on. So we need, and we need to publish more, I think, about that. Finally, I think that uh, ICOM is going to change now, in October, the Code of Ethics. And I still think we have a big problem with medical collections all over Europe. Not so much the, hum yeah, it's, yeah, also human remains, you know. But even the definition of human remains, and when we talk, to other colleagues, it is, it, it, skeletons and so on. No, we're talking about tissues, we're talking about uh, liquid collections, we're talking about uh, this so, it's so diverse and the provenance raises so many issues and we need to start addressing that. We cannot just hide it under the carpet. And yeah, and lead also there. So, trying to find our place between these tensions, decolonization, which is really the topic of the present, of the museum and cultural sector, and ethics. I think there is a lot of work to be done here. So, to me, it's no coincidence that the recovery of university museums aligns with this growing collective movement. It's the best example I can think of, the power of networks, which is a cliche, but this is really the power of networks. First with a sense of emergency outwards and then with coordination aims inwards. Together, we created multiple collectives and I'm proud and honored to have been part of them with so many of you. Thank you. Yeah, I sit here. I stay Do here. you want to have questions? Yes. I don't know if this time. I don't know. We have uh, some uh, some time. Uh, 
we have 15 minutes so if you want to ask Marta C. Lorenzo um, yeah we have time for it if not I'll Any be question? here the whole day yeah huh? Marlene. They don't hear you. They don't hear you. I don't think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Before answering that, let me just say that um, there has been such an increase of um, collections-based teaching and research also because the techniques that's another problem you know the research going back to archaeology collections and natural history collections has a lot to do with the techniques you can measure different things that you couldn't before and so on uh, but so you, there's a return definitely to uh, collections and museums and of course we have benefited from that there are university small even small university museums that have dozens of students working in the museum doing field work and I think that we should do at some point a profile of the area um, I, we need I mean this is just some notes some reflection but we really this the, the the community changed so much we really needed to go and have a big survey I know this fatigue of surveys yeah but in Europe how many students are there, uh, staff, the question of the careers of staff, because there could be at some point the possibility of in some museums, researchers and docents were eliminated in some university museums. We could have them back. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. So how to inspire students to take the lead? I don't know. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it's all about teaching, right? The way you, um, I definitely think that university museums should play a much more important role in the training of museum professionals than they still do, okay? So, and if we, we, if we train more museum professionals, I think that eventually we will, uh, we're still, you know, museum studies and so on except you maybe but yeah but they don't use much but again we need a profile of the area who uses the museum and for what for what kind of students you know I don't know another question <laughs> if you have another question I would like to kindly ask to come to the microphone thank you Yeah. 
Raz, jeden, jeden, dwa, trzy, okay. raz, raz. Panie Ulu, idę. Okay. And I'm just looking at the new campus and all the new buildings that come up. Not only, obviously, there's a lot of change in digital, and we talk a lot about the digital, but I also see there's a change in the physical, which is also like kind of our, our responsibility. And we both have been working for years on this kind of the recent scientific heritage, right? Like, which we defined as after 45, right? Like, and I now, now I see recent scientific heritage now is after 2000, right? Like, after we started. And I feel like we need a whole new round of kind of seeing what are the challenges of this kind of material heritage that has been developed, that has been coming up, right? Like, and both in its physicality and its structure, but also in the kind of how it's funded, whatever, right? Like, I see a lot of this comes up. University doesn't build the buildings itself anymore, right? Like, it's like, builds like kind of private entities to set up these buildings, right? Like, so the whole structure of the university has also changed, right? And obviously, I don't have answers to this. I'm just kind of exploring this, right? Like, because obviously, me as a historian of science, right? Like, you're always kind of stuck in the past, right? And then you kind of see, and you're kind of like, just like, shattered, but what's going on in the present, right? Like, so, I mean, obviously, I don't have answers to this, right? Like, but I think we really have to have a kind of a new round of uh, what, is, what is the recent, recent university, and not only what it is digitality. Obviously, we have been engaged with a lot of digitality of teaching during COVID-19, which is another story, right? Like, which we probably have to talk about what has changed, what has not changed. I think it also, COVID-19 showed us also the limitations of this whole digital teaching, right? Like this whole hype around digital teaching. Uh, but also to, 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 to grapple with this kind of new kind of materiality that uh, the current university is confronting us with and which we have to curate in a certain way as well, right? Like as university museums and we have to address in certain university ways in university museums. So it's, it's rather a comment than, I don't know whether you want to say something. It's included in this. I think we should learn more about the situation now because it changed so much in, in quality and in quantity that uh, for me it's difficult to have a photograph. And also the university changed, as Roland said. So for me it's difficult to have a reflection about the present. Maybe because I was away from Universeum for six years, so I, I missed a little bit the European vibe. I can tell you more about the difference between university museums in China and in Europe, for example and so, which are significant. And so that's another thing, it's the European thing. We're not alone, we're not a monolith, right? And we're not alone. There's a lot um, to be, there's a lot to be learned from other geographies. Well, I think that's it. Oh, there is another one. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joanna, I'm from Jagiellonian University Museum. Thank you for your speech and for your old text that were really uh, inspiring for me for a long time. So uh, that's why I am also still in the place where I am. <laughs> 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 
So, but I have w one of reflections. Of course, it's one of a uh, few, I think. But for me and from my perspective, my own and uh, from my institution perspective, I think that networking in different ways is really helpful. No matter if we are realizing big projects together or not, if we um, give really much time and energy and we make brainstormings and back and someone asks, what, what plan you have? What project you have? No, we have not any project. But after this brainstorming, after reflection, after different perspectives, you, are, you have really much more experience. And this were really helpful experience for me. Uh, Universeum, the UMAC, Coimbra Group, UNA Europa, etc., etc., and uh, different networks um, developing in different times. Yes, but there is some point when they are connecting together, and the same situation I think is in uh, different countries with universities, museums, and collections, uh, because in Poland problems were different art than, for example, in UK and Australia. But experiences of Australia and UK and Germany are really inspiring for us today. And what I think that we have really, uh, we are in some point together, we are connected and we are supportive to each other. And this is really important thing. Maybe we develop in different ways our collections and our procedures because all the university functioning in different way than the young one. When I see uh, our colleagues from board of uh, University Association, uh, Museum uh, University Association of Poland, from Poland, I think that um, our case, I'm not saying that because this is our association, but our case is really important one in Europe because we uh, developed really fast. Uh, Marek, um, Hubert and Magda, together with uh, Eva, they started from very beginning, long, long time ago, also during the meeting in Krakow. But what they done, what they said to us, what they gave us, I really am yeah, thankful. Okay. Yes, I'm thankful to Eva Vika because um, she brought me here. So thank you really much. And this was the door that were open yeah. much for me. And uh, it really was, uh, the creative time uh, for me. But what we are doing with these projects, with different projects, with old catalogs, uh, how we are working not only on boards but uh, in own institutions, in own departments, we are on different levels. But together we are a uh, really big community. Really and exactly. Yes. And uh, so that's why this networking also is dynamic. There was some question, uh, you remember we organized some small session in Krakow together with Coimbra, you was yeah, connected yeah. with yeah. us. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. And the question was, what for we need networking? Our rectors sometimes, they need to ask why we pay for networking. Before I came here yesterday, I had one of meetings with vice rector and we need to summarize um, our activities and we know that we need it even if we don't realize project with a lot of money but we are really and much you more don't know why you need yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> and a lot of friendships so that's why we say hi and we send a lot but of then, hugs to Sebastian yeah exactly but let me just interrupt just because I forgot to say something very important it's not only about being you know here in a beautiful university or being in Strasbourg or Uppsala it's also about committing to your network. What does that mean? It means to step up and join boards and help, you know, and because when there's an election, it's kind of zero persons, right? Same with you, Mac. So the, it requires commitment, not only like benefiting all the time, because we all benefit in different ways. We adapt to our own situation, but the network needs you. It needs you to step up, whether at national level, international level, or at the university, at local level. So we really need to commit on the bit for the benefit of the collective. I think that's very, very important. It's not only thinking about, yeah, it's so good to be here and so on. 
It's really, you know, I'm committed with this collective. I want to give hours of my work to this community because I believe what they're doing is important. I think that's sometimes not stressed enough. One thing more, networking, for example, helped us to yeah. uh, to invite students for our projects, to invite professors, because we organize network inside of our university because of outside networking. So this is our case from Jagiellon University at the moment with few, with few projects. Yeah. And uh, important is the long-term discussion, even if we not change the law, if we not um, collect money, but this long-term discussion, this annual meetings, uh, small sessions, uh, even small talks, um, yeah. this is one step more Absolutely. every day. So uh, it Thank was a great much. pleasure <laughs> to be here with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We are encouraged to uh, networking, so it's time for it, because uh, I would like to uh, invite, you are invited uh, to a coffee break uh, in the corridor of uh, Oratorium Marianum. I mean, the hall uh, where most of us uh, uh, met yesterday evening. So, see you after a uh, coffee break. That uh, will be 10.30.
to tak jest. No i dobra. Nie, aha, bo tu masz te. Bo musi wziąć ci kogoś. A dobra. Bo to mi koniec. Poczekaj chwilę, dobra, dobra. Dear colleagues, dear friends, unfortunately, it is online that I have to open this 24th annual meeting of Universium. And though personal issues prevent me from. Okay, dobra, so Jarek idzie.
Um, but we have to start uh, the first session, uh, which I'm delighted uh, to, to, to chair. Uh, and I thank very much my dear colleagues from the Universal Board that um, asked me to do this uh, job for you uh, and for the conference. My name is Marlene Mulliu. I have been involved in the past uh, with the board uh, work uh, for several years. Uh, and um, I'm delighted to be back with you. Every time I, I'm taking part in a uh, meeting of uh, Universelm, I feel this balance between formality and informality. What Marta said uh, that makes uh, Universelm so unique. It's a big uh, organization with very friendly uh, at, um, connections and very um, creative ways to work together. Um, before we start the presentations, uh, we will have the chance to watch the speech uh, that um, Sebastian Subirhan, uh, the chair of Universal, prepared for us. So we are ready to uh, listen to uh, Sebastian. Thanks, dear friends. Unfortunately, it is online that I have to open this 24th annual meeting of Universum. And though personal issues prevent me from being with you this year, it was still important for me to share this moment with you. Frederic, Maria and Martin couldn't make it either, but though not physically present, we've been working hand in hand together with the colleagues from Foklov and the board of the Association of Polish University Museums to organize this annual conference. And we already have many reasons to be joyful. Once again, this annual conference is a great demonstration of the dynamic of our network. We received more than 60 applications for papers, and there are more than 120 persons that registered for the conference. We were also able to offer seven travel grants to encourage the participation of students and early career professionals. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome them, together with the numerous colleagues that attend Universal Conference for the first time. I am confident that you will enjoy your time among our community and share your experience of academic heritage, as we offered this year to focus on. We wanted, on the one hand, to resonate the new definition of museum that was voted during the last general conference of ICOM last year in Prague, and on the other hand, to move beyond on the celebrating to also critically reflect about academic heritage and the experiences it offers and provides. Are there other directions in which you would like to take the interpretation and experience of university collections further? Should we be doing more with what we have? What are the opportunities and obstacles in realizing our full potential within our collections, museums and institutions? Those are the questions we wanted to address through various sub-themes. Needless to say that the diversity of experiences that will be discussed and shared during the conference is stupendous and goes beyond our expectation. Before concluding, I know that our Polish colleagues are in class connections with Ukrainian universities, and though we didn't succeed to organize a pre-conference workshop to address this terrible issue, I would like to express my warmest wishes and support to our Ukrainian colleagues still confronted to war. Let's hope this tragedy will end as soon as possible. To conclude, I would like to thank, in the name of Universum Board, our dearest colleagues, Mata Lorenzo and Niels Curtis, who agreed to respectively, respectively open and wrap up our conference. Thank you so much, dear friends, for your long-lasting commitment and support of Universum. Thanks also to Esther, our valiant secretary, that will represent Universum board, board during the whole conference. You will be our voice and our eyes. Thank you for that. Many thanks, of course, to the board of the Association of Polish University Museum, who wonderfully managed the organization of the conference and succeeded to raise funds from the Ministry of Education and Science. And I have already experienced the hospitality of our Polish colleagues, and I'm real sure that you will have a great experience with them during the whole conference. Last but not least, many thanks to our host, the University of Hoklov. 
and the numerous colleagues involved to make this conference already a success. I am deeply sorry to miss this opportunity to discover the richness of your academic heritage, but this is only a postponement. I wish you all a great conference and I will see you next year in flesh in Dresden. It's always uh, a pleasure to have uh, Sebastian uh, speaking to us, giving his uh, welcoming notes. And I'm sure he will be following our conversations and uh, be connected with us in many different ways. Uh, but it's about to start, it's about time to start. Uh, I think uh, the organizing committee did a great job this year and chose a very pertinent subject uh, for uh, us to discuss all together, the experience we can have in academic heritage within this framework, uh, for whom we build these experiences and who builds them. This is the topic of the first session, uh, a very important one. As Marta said before, uh, Universeum is renowned, renowned for uh, creating big questions uh, and trying to find candid answers to these uh, important questions that relate us all. So we have uh, one hour of a session, three uh, presentations, um, 15 minutes for each and 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, I welcome uh, the first speaker, uh, Gina Kutsika, um, uh, Director of um, Audiences and uh, Content from the Ashmolean Museum. I'm delighted that I welcome her as first speaker. I know Gina for a very long time. And I'm sure she has wonderful and very interesting uh, uh, ideas to share with us. Gina, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. This is my first um, Universeum conference. For 28 years, I've been working in big museums in London, like the VNA, Kew Gardens, Natural History Museum, Tate, with over 1,000 employees. So when I moved into the Asmolian, which for those, most of you will know it, but in case any of you don't know it, Thank you. I'm originally Greek. We can't stand still. <laughs> so, um, thank you. So, when I moved into the Ashmolean, which was 340 years old this May, uh, from large organizations, I had a shock because I found it with 280 employees, I found it very small. So, please, if I say things that uh, don't resonate, please bear with me because this is my journey from coming from the outside into academia and being in the museum for a year and a half. So I was trying, this is our museum, the Asmolian, and, and I was trying to find an image that would have, that would explain my role. And this is an icon from our museum of St. George not only it's my patron saint, but also the year and a half, I felt like that I've been slaying dragons and hopefully saving princes. Time will tell. So what does it mean to become an audience focus museum? And my role, I was employed to ensure that our museum is fit for our audiences. And when we talk about audiences, we talk about anyone. So we talk about the academics and our university students, we talk about the professional services staff, we talk about the colleges, we talk about the public and anyone in the public. So it's a very wide range. And being audience focused is making sure that what we do meets the needs of our audiences and listen to our audiences. And one of the first things that I did when I joined was trying to understand the context of what does it mean to be in a university museum and listen to my teams. My teams are around 80, 85 people doing different things from communications, academic engagement, public engagement, digital learning interpretation, and understanding what they were doing and how they were serving, um, who we were serving. And the thing that they told me was that they wanted communications, we have them, they wanted transparency. I didn't know what came to them. They, 
uh, because I'm very direct and they had transparency and, and they wanted to be heard. I was delighted when I arrived to find out all of the good work that was doing. Nothing, there was nothing that I would say, this is bad, this is problematic. Everything was good, everything was sought through, millions of, not millions, lots of projects, and attempts of co-curations, attempts of co-productions, and a lot of kind things happening for our audience and for diverse audiences. However, when I started digging, I realized that we were like a meadow of wild flowers that were blooming beautifully whenever they bloom. We had no idea what was going to come next. We had no idea how the wildlife creatures were using it. And we were over serving the same audiences again and again while ignoring some others. Unintentionally, everything was unintentional. So I said, I talked talk with my things of how could we create a garden collectively, and an English garden, not very formal, but one that has some strategy that can bloom throughout the year and that can be enjoyed by different people. And this was painful. This was painful because I have colleagues that have been there for 20, 22 years, have been doing 20, 22 years the same thing with a little bit of variation and have been doing good things. So it's very easy to go and change something bad. It's quite difficult to say, change something good and say what I'm asking you is to be more strategic. What I'm asking you is to be more focused. What I'm asking you is to be more accountable. So to have measures of a success and know whether you have delivered something, to, to have some outcomes to know what you want to do, how you want to engage with people. Some of my teams, actually quite a lot of my teams, found the change liberating. And they became, they were Anglo-Saxons, the majority polite, lovely people. They became the, the mouthpiece. Because I managed to offend almost everybody in the Asmolia in my first two months. Then there were a few that found change challenging and we had to bring them along. And we did that with a lot of training. We had away days, we had director training, everything they told me that they needed, I, I made sure that I provided so that they would feel more competent and confident. Confident as well, they would feel more confident. And we had a couple of colleagues that um, still find, and there are two out of the 85, that they still find change very, very painful. So, one of the first things that we did as a museum, not only my directorate, look at our purpose and mission. Why, why are we here? So that we could provide the things a clear direction. So, and this is something I am I'm very proud of my colleagues. All of the 280 and all of hundreds of volunteers had multiple chances to input into this vision. So together, through workshop, and this was, if you allow me, academia at its best, every single word was debated and discussed again and again and again. And then we found something that of course is not perfect and we want to change it, but at least something that would reflect what we were doing. And we did that collectively. So there was buying. And in addition to our strategy and purpose, we had five priorities, which were our people, the, the people, staff and volunteers, which were um, uh, inclusivity, be equitable and inclusive, financial sustainability. The Asmolian only gets two zero, twenty percent from the university. We've got to raise the rest. So it's not enough. Um, people say, oh, you're rich. No, we're not. Twenty percent. We work very hard from every penny we raise, and um, environmental sustainability, and then being, having a museum that fit for the future. And that gave us a lot of uh, an ability to focus, and an ability to say we are stopped doing some things, we will do some other things because they don't meet our priorities, and we will do some other things. So if I give an example of the early years, um, 
I, I love family. I think if you get children in a family group in the museum, you create visitors for life. And 33 years in museum as a volunteer and then professional, I, I have evidence and I believe it. The, not a lot of families come to the Asmolia, even though we have amazing um, big sculptures and incredible collections to engage. So what we, with our family changes, what we're trying to do is create family interventions in the gallery so that if a family comes and there, are, there isn't a program that is specific for um, babies or toddlers, young people or teenagers, mm -hmm that they can find something in the galleries for them to do. Something that is beyond the activity trail, which work, but is not the only way. The second thing we did was having um, two types of um, programs, and they say of the same quality. One was a pro Oxford is a, a town of two halves, quite affluent people, rich people, and quite deprived people. So the same program, we, we sell it for people that can afford, so they pay to attend, and we give it for free to the user. It's subsidized for those in need. And that enables us to raise money to make the 80% that we need to raise, but also to ensure that the people that cannot afford could do things um, in our museum. The second thing that I did, and this hasn't worked, is work in progress, hasn't worked yet. It, I heard so many complaints across the museum that we don't know how decisions are made, why you decide on this digital content and this program, this communication. So I thought, okay, let's create a committee. Of course, we are in a university. Let's create a committee to decide collectively what, how we, um, what are our exhibitions, what are our programs, what is the digital content. The reason why. I personally think it doesn't work. My team thinks it's brilliant. It's because it takes too long. You have to fill a form, and then you go to the committee, and then the committee decides, and then you have complaints. But um, I, I'm thinking that we have I've swept the pendulum from having chaos, sorry, a little bit of chaos into having a process in the hope that when we have our house in order, we will be able to be more flexible, more uh, dynamic, and more opp opportunistic, because the whole point of, me, of this committee was to talk to our colleagues so that we didn't work in silence, but everybody talked to each other and we were coordinated. The other thing um, that we did was thinking about the audience. The yes, Asmodian, since 2013, has been doing a lot of data collection of who, who comes to the museum, why they come, which is great, which is absolutely great. However, it was not done systematically, and it was not, not done in a way that we could compare the data. So every single person that did some modern research asked different questions, which means you have hundreds of data that you cannot compare. So one of the first things was to create an evaluation framework that is used across the museum that everyone asks some core questions and then specified for their program. So at the end, we can compare the data. The second thing that, um, that we did, we got an external uh, expert, an external um, evaluator to, to find out who are our audience and segment them, group them. So we are in the, in currently, we, are, we have data for just under 1,500 uh, people of in-depth questions plus um, uh, surveys online and on site. And the, the draft idea is that there are eight types of people that visit the Asmolia. And this is vital for us in order to understand, first of all, to have a common language when we talk to each other, because I really want my colleagues talk to each other. That's my first thing. Uh, not as friends, but professionally. Uh, because we are all friends, great friends, to talk to each other, but also so to have a common language, but also understand the audiences. And when we produce something for them, might be a program, or even something we sell in the shop, or um, 
digital content on the website, we know that it is for them and we know that the result that we're is going to have impact and benefit. So, uh, in a year and a half, where, where are we? we? We are at the start of the journey and we are sailing optimistically. Um, we have the, the vast, vast majority of the teams working together and working on the same direction and having a purpose of what we want to do. It takes time. I haven't done anything in the Asmolian that is glittery and cold and was written in the press because I'm, I'm doing the infrastructure, the, the, the basics that will enable us to, to do things that have impact and to do things that make good use of our resources. And what is coming next is we will finalize the, the, the current audience segmentation and then in 2024, we will start at the non-visitors, new audience, who doesn't come to the museum. And also they could be, and now when we identify who doesn't come, from those that don't come, who are the potential audiences. So one thing that surprised me a lot is that we don't have people from the university community visiting us, only 2%. They don't, unless they have a curriculum um, reason. But I want the astrophysics in, uh, in Oxford to come. I want the dinner ladies at the colleges to come. I want everybody to feel we are their local museum because we are their local museum and, and have this ownership. And also, after we collect enough data, we will be able to see where we are, whether our interventions are working. Sorry. I made a mistake when I said I haven't done anything gold and glossy. My team have done a lot of really good work. They have, they have experimented, they have piloted, but they are not massive. They are little programs that we are testing to see what impact they have. And when we evaluate those programs, then we will know how to move forward with our audiences. So this is the journey. I hope I will be lucky enough to come to future Universum conferences and be able to learn from you and share with you what we have done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina, for this um, very, very inspiring, provocative uh, first presentation of the session. I'm sure uh, we have uh, noted down a lot of questions and um, ideas to share after in the discussion time. Um, let me come now to the first, uh, to the second um, uh, presentation. There is a slight change in the program, uh, but just a slight one. So I welcome uh, Silke Ackerman, who will represent uh, a team of um, um, colleagues. Uh, I named them uh, Marcon, Sofia Tallas, uh, Ms. Zagallo from the University of Padova and Silke from the University of Oxford and the History of Science Museum to uh, talk about uh, the new definition uh, and uh, reflect on its impact uh, a year after its uh, implementation, its um, um, uh, put into force. Silke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, Jim Dobbin. I have the scary honor of not being one person presenting two uh, institutions, but also four different colleagues. Um, so I do my very best. And please imagine them standing here to have Sophia and Fanny next to me. And Monica is actually in the audience and she will join us for the discussion. So, um, inclusion and participation, we have already discussed it at various occasions um, this morning, have become some of the main keywords used in museums in the past uh, years. And participation, of course, includes co-creation, uh, fostered by the new ICOM um, definition, the ICOM the definition for new museums that was launched last year. <clears throat> So that's all very good, and we are all, of course, very passionate about that. That's great. Let's go and do it. Uh, but what are the actual challenges? 
uh, when uh, faced by university museums, when we are trying to implement those. And when I say university museums, I'm thinking of smaller institutions. The Ashmole is a slightly different case um, because it's a very large institution, but the ones um, that have just a few staff um, and are closely embedded in their um, faculties, probably. So we will discuss two um, case studies that are similar and also different. Um, one is uh, from Padua. It was led uh, by the Giovanni Pollevi Museum, by the three colleagues I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's called Science from the Islamic World to Today's Europe. And the other one is a, is a project that has been long running in Oxford called Multaka. Multaka is Arabic for meeting point. Uh, and the History of Science Museum is the lead for that, so I'm the uh, director for that project. Let's start with the Polini Museum, and please, uh, Con, bear with me, because I'm presenting here a uh, part of, uh, uh, I'm presenting a project that is not mine, uh, but I'm doing my very best uh, to do that with uh, Monica looking at me, encouraging me. So, what are the challenges that were um, encountered by our colleagues in Padua? Um, let's just briefly remind ourselves what this project is actually about. One of the main goals was to develop new ways to present to the public aspects of the development of science, shedding light on the exchanges between various countries, civilizations and cultures. Important in this bit is that it is a one-year project with quite a low budget. Um, Co-creation um, with the knowledge of local communities is very much at the heart of it. And four working groups were set up. Each of them first had some training meetings and then developed a new communication project. How were those working groups set up? Our colleagues in Padua got in touch with associations, adult schools, and local mosques, um, and found that initially the uh, leaders of those communities uh, were a little suspicious. Why are they coming suddenly to us? What, what do they want? Uh, it was a completely new proposal in Padua, so it's not that there is um, other precedents on which um, the project could um, base itself on. But then they very quickly became enthusiastic about the project. So Sophia was invited to present the project on the occasion of Ibn al-Fitr, so the end of Ramadan. Um, the first time that anybody from the university was invited on this occasion, so that is really um, a cause for celebration. But what happened in practice? Not many people from the community actually entered the working groups. The heads of the community asked insistently, what background knowledge do the people have to have? Do they have to have a science degree? What, what do they need to know? So a barrier rose between the communities and the university. I may not be good enough. I may be embarrassing myself. I may be judged. So, finally, many recently arrived uh, immigrants attended the meetings because they didn't come on their own. They came with their schools and associations. So that was a very positive contact to have. But from the established, established Muslim communities, far fewer people came along. And it turned out that there were those who had the, uh, a related background, if you like. There were engineers, physicians, heads of the cultural centers, etc. So, it, one of the reflections from our colleagues in Padua is that this is a gap, a threshold, they weren't able to overcome at the time. But hoping that this is just the first step. So, something to, really important to bear in mind, which Marta has already referenced, that the university is different. It is not us. What do they want from us? Do I, will I, will I be judged? So a second challenge was um, that these working groups would become a kind of ghetto. So the university 
or the museum rather, the university museum works with the working groups and that happens somewhere in the university, but the rest of the university has nothing to do with it. And that is of course a major risk. So it's not really university, it's university museum. But, and that is where um, I personally think our part of our colleagues took a really excellent step. They included students from uh, physics and PhD students from astronomy, both PhD students. And that is something which the university encouraged because they saw it as a development of soft skills for the students. So it is not just, forgive me, a project that is run by the university museum and has nothing to do with the university, a challenge which Marta also referenced earlier but it's something which is done from all the different, or at least quite a few of the different constituents of the university. So it becomes almost makeup, part of the makeup of the university. And um, a shared experience, the students coming with their experience, know nothing about the, the, the topics. The community members coming with their experience, knowing nothing about the topic, learning together. <clears throat> However, a new challenge emerged. So many people with so many different backgrounds, often linguistic issues, how can we make them work together? And I mean, we're all museum people in this room, so we all know that the power of objects um, is a fantastic may in the magic of objects, not knowing anything, but as I often say, it's not just looking, it's seeing for yourself and seeing every person can do. That is not a matter of having a particular background. It's not saying, oh, I see a cross, therefore it must be Christian, because the cross could be something completely different. Not every swastika is Nazi. And that is why seeing for yourself and describing, rather than thinking you have to interpret immediately, is a really, really important step. So a number of hands-on sessions were organized and the participants could bring in their own experience in that and learn from each other what were they seeing. Somebody might have a particular uh, experience that somebody else didn't have, but they could uh, share that knowledge together. Now, this is the point where Sophia wants me to say that participants particularly enjoyed the hands-on workshop on Eastern and Western astrolabes conducted by a certain Zilga Ackerman from Oxford and Taha Yassin Aslan University from Istanbul. So you see us very involved with the team there. Uh, it was great fun and a great opportunity for us to learn from those groups. Um, and again, very interesting because astrolabes, astronomical instruments mean nothing to the majority of people. If I ask colleagues in this room, or many of you know what an astrolabe is and how it works, you might say, no, that's not my special field. And that is actually a very unifying factor because everybody looked at something which was new to most people. So what about the co-creation of the project? What about the freedom, if any, for left to the working groups? Because so far, this had all been very organized, very structured, very guided. The four working groups came up with very, very different proposals. Some were more traditional. <clears throat> um, for example, a group made up of um, recently arrived immigrants uh, decided to write labels in their mother tongue. And for those of you who read Arabic, um, I'd just like to point out that something appears to have gone wrong with the font there, uh, that those are separate Arabic letters. Um, this is not linked. Uh, but that happens quite frequently on uh, when labels are trans, um, put into a different font. So do not let that worry you. Another group came up, or other groups, I should say, came up with totally unexpected proposals. For example, setting up a piece of theatre focused on an astrolabe where the public receives, through other narrative, various parts of a cardboard astrolabe. So that. Um, astronomical instrument I mentioned earlier, the epitome of transfer of knowledge between the Islamic world and Europe. <clears throat> um, another challenge, of course, and this is where I turn to Oxford, the project I lead myself, 
is the question of what we really mean by inclusion and what that really entails. Because it's so easy to say we want to be inclusive. And of course, in Ultica, the project that in the Arabic for meeting point has that idea that um, we bring people together. But inclusion is a lot more than some people, especially funders, um, think it might be. It is not just getting people through the door. It just isn't. That isn't enough. Although it takes a lot of boxes for some people, it's not that. It needs to be something which is far more sustainable and addresses what the challenges are. It is about addressing the um, systematic power imbalances that have created exclusionary practices in the first place. And that is something, and I'm reflecting on a, a project that has been running since 2017, something we have learned. Because to be inclusive, we have to have, initially, we define, that's what we normally do, a group, a target group. But to be included, you have to have been excluded before. And that is very much, we found, a Eurocentric and often middle class centric perspective to see that as the norm. We are included, you are not, and we are now going to work with you. And of course, this, this kind of language means that everyone else is othered. The language means that we are the norm and everything else is different. Whether the people we are talking to see themselves like that is very rarely asked. And also, there is a kind of expectation that those communities um, will almost have a sense of gratitude. And we feel they would be benefiting from it. And if you see the language I'm using here, it's actually quite colonial in many ways. The target groups, of course, know they have been targeted. They know why the organizations want to work with them. That's often due to funding or because of political guidance from above. This is what you should be doing and we need to tick boxes. But many of them have had various bad experiences with institutions. And one example which always um, I'm, in, I'm reminded of um, is the Victorian Albert Museum in London doing an exhibition on Sikh, working very closely with the Sikh community with that, on that occasion, fantastic collaboration. But once the exhibition was over, that collaboration stopped, that inclusion stopped. Not a single member of the Sikh community then came to the Rembrandt exhibition. So that is not inclusion. That is a one-off. Also, there is a lot of criticism. So I get frequently asked with the Multica project, which initially focused on uh, forced migrants, initially, initially from Iraq and Syria, because that was the most pressing um, challenge we faced in Oxford, being a very small place. Um, and it's now widened to every recent arrival in Oxford from all places. Um, I got a lot of criticism for, um, you know, the. Uh, typical Oxford communities who said, why are you focusing on those people and not on the white, disenfranchised young men in other parts of Oxford? Now, you have to be aware, you may not be aware of that, but it might be good to be aware of it, that Oxford has some of the richest areas of the England. It also has some of the poorest. So they live very, very close to each other, massive clashes. So how do we bring those individuals in and how we, do we bring the different communities together? Because, of course, the community from Iraq in Oxford is a different community from the one from Zimbabwe, those from Ukraine. How do we bring them together? And, of course, um, as usual, it is the magic of objects, but it's also taking a plunge and um, creating trust. Because, as I said earlier, with the example from the VNA and the Sikh um, community, communities or those who we want to include, leaving aside now that um, problematic of what inclusion really means, 
um, need to feel, want to feel, and this is not just a box ticking exercise. They want to feel that they're listened to, that they're not just a number in a, in a statistic at the end, but that their views really matter. And that can only happen if the, in our, if the institution, in our case, that university museum, listens. And if it changes, if it's willing to change. And uh, I can honestly say that um, the challenges for Multica were as much uh, external working with communities as they were internal. Because when we change practices, everybody here in the room knows that, that means, and uh, Gina has just referred to it, that means changing mindset. What's wrong with what we have done so far? Why should we change it? Why should we have um, discussion on an equal level? And the most important community in this context that can really help us change that mindset are, of course, the academics themselves. When they buy into these projects, into these, um, into these uh, new approaches, um, generally academics and students, but also the other communities outside to bring the internal and external communities together. And we are very closely watched by those external communities whether we are actually changing our practice. So what are we doing different now from when we started in 2017 to now in 2023? So what we have learned, and I'm now summarizing both projects, is that the outcomes of inclusionary and participatory practice can be absolutely phenomenal, mind-boggling, unexpected, touching, the reason to get out of bed in the morning, absolutely magic. But we also need to be aware of some important factors. One of those is fear. The fear of the university or of university museums of fear of being exposed, fear of not being good enough. Why are they asking me? What do they want from me? We need time and we need patience. This is not something that can happen overnight. And we found that when our funding, our initial funding went out at Voltaka after two years, the project almost stalled. I vividly remember if I went back to the halfway through the pandemic because we had no funding to continue. And the, the participants started dispersing. So this really requires the patience and the time to be able to build this trust and to sustain it. Inclusion has to be sustainable. But also difficult questions. How at whom do we include? Do those people actually want to be included? Who gets excluded if I include some? And not just including those from the outside, but also that's lesson we learned both in part one in Oxford. It's absolutely crucial to include those on the inside, our internal communities. Marta made the point that the politics for university museums are tricky within the university. We can be seen as a burden, as a drain on resources. We are not in the business of museums. Um, if these projects are not supported by or uh, enthusiastically involved by uh, internal members, this is not going to happen. Now, resources, really, really vital in this. Uh, not just the sweet teeth, but every kind of resource here. Um, small scale projects in Padua may appear almost cost neutral, but of course they're not because you're putting staff resources to it. You make a conscious decision that out of the however many working hours you have, a proportion goes to this project. And that means either you put in a lot of additional overtime, as we all, all do of us in this room, I'm sure, or you say something else is not happening. And that is a very conscious decision about resources. And a long-term project, like the one we're running in Multaka, um, now uh, works with over 200 community members from all over all the communities we have in Oxford, really needs additional funds to sustain that. So to work with the recently arrived migrants in a hotel who are extremely vulnerable, that's not something you could do in half an hour during your lunch break. But it's also about managing expectations. Because as we all know, university leaders can change their focus 
very, very clicky. We have lots of ideas what museums should achieve. So the flavor of the month in Oxford now is social prescribing. So culture being prescribed like medication is prescribed. Now this is wonderful and we love it. But what else are we not doing whilst we're doing it? Because if the communities we bring in, the communities we include, internal and external, get dropped, the damage can be huge and non-recoverable. And that is one of the main learnings from the two projects, or particularly the one in Oxford, that we should only take it on if we have taken all of that into account and know that we're not letting communities down. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silke, and, uh, and um, uh, your, uh, your group of um, colleagues. Really uh, resonating um, ideas. We, we can think about all this um, uh, in connection also with uh, Gina's uh, presentation. It's interesting also that you bring in the realities of, uh, of the same city, Oxford, from different angles. We can discuss that uh, later. But now we will go to the third presentation um, and to Ukraine, which is a, a different reality, different challenges there. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will have a lot to, um, to reflect on. I welcome um, uh, the colleague, uh, Zetlana Muraska, from uh, Ukraine, to come to the floor. Uh, the title of her presentation is The Community of the University Museum Staff in Ukraine. All happy families are alike and unhappy ones differ. Very provocative uh, title. Thank you. Svetlana is an associate professor at the department. Svetlana is uh, an associate professor of the Department of History, Museum Studies, and Cultural Heritage at the Liv Polytechnic National University and a research consultant at the University Museum. I am a little bit worried, so oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot, I forgot. Okay, uh, everyone, is everyone hearing me? Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, dear friends. The first thing I would like uh, to say here, um, to such a distinguished and very close to my professional interest community, is thank you for great support that I, at my... Um, and you, of all Ukrainians feel uh, during this year. I say these words in Warsaw last year, and I, say, uh, I repeat uh, these words with uh, no less sincerity uh, now here in Warsaw. Uh, the simple word thank you is too less. Uh, it will not be enough for me and uh, to, uh, to uh, express my gratitude. What about the community of university museum staff in Ukraine? Um, So sorry. Um, uh, we understand that uh, university and uh, that university and museum are faced between two walls, university and museum. Marta Lorenzo wrote about uh, uh, it uh, probably almost 20 years ago. And when I think 15 years ago, I found out this thesis. I understood, oh my God, the situation is in Ukraine are too similar to the situation in the whole Europe. Uh, but um, when I when 20 years ago, I began to work at the Museum of National University of Oster Academy, my professional identification was too unclear. Uh, later, researching the activities of U University Museum in Ukraine, I understood that uh, issue of professional identification is uh, uh, really important for people because we can uh, can be engaged and can be really eff effective in for 
professional community only in such case when we feel uh, belonging to it. Uh, so, uh, researchers traditionally consider a person uh, in process of their prof professionalization as a subject of two institutions, uh, profession and organization. Professional uh, identity is a complex formation which traditionally has three uh, components. Cognitive knowledge about characteristics of one professional group, um, values, assessment of the whole group and attitude to membership of it, and emotional exception or uh, rejection of one group. As a result of successful identification, as I said uh, previously, uh, people uh, would like to be really, uh, really museum professionalists. So, um, I must say that my research is mostly considered museological point of view, not psychological, because I am a museologist and this why. So, uh, the area of my empirical research is the West regions of Ukraine, the seven regions. Um, I can count, but it doesn't matter, so uh, West regions of Ukraine. And uh, um, it's a near uh, four institution in Ukraine we call it high educational institution. No, not only universities, but academies, uh, uh, institutes, and uh, so on. Um, and uh, I should mention that I have um, probably 100 uh, interviews with different person. Uh, a lot of them were uh, via offline, some were uh, via mail or phone. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, it's inter interesting because when I asked people about their professional identification, um, it was like first or third, not, not first, probably third uh, question. And when I repeat the same question at the end of our conversation, the answer were, too, uh, were different. Uh, so um, I should mention that uh, the sense um, of uh, disconnection with uh, a uh, professional group increases in the proportion of the activity of such an employer as a museum visitor. Uh, of course, um, when people try to be uh, effective, uh, and they understand, I uh, work in a university museum, but probably I belong more to museum world, not to the university. And uh, at the such moment, the person um, understands, understands that, oh, but I'm also a museum, uh, but I also work at university. So who I am, um, probably, and which side of me is bigger. And for a lot of university museum staff, the answer on this question is not uh, easy and it's not clear. So um, the main, uh, one of the main findings of the study is uh, next one. Oh. Uh, the clear identification of the museum staff community observes in staff uh, less than 10 percent of university museums in Ukraine. And now I just write down some answers on the questions. Uh, when people uh, said, yes, I feel myself like university, uh, not university, like museum staff, uh, and, uh, but it's only less than 10 percent. So it's so small uh, amount as for me. And mostly, uh, this category includes people who have worked at museum, pre public museum or state museum, uh, or continue to work parallel to be, to be engaged in university and uh, also to be engaged in a, a museum uh, in the city, region, and so on. Mm. But uh, I also should mention that presence of uh, not only one, but uh, two, four, five, and more uh, museums at university has a positive effect uh, on the formation of sense of museum community among staff because people uh, feel that they are not alone, that, uh, all, that probably uh, we are too similar with our colleagues. Uh, but, uh, but what's about situation when person uh, is only one uh, museum professional? It's, a uh, very often a situation because uh, it's only one museum and only one person who like director to a guide and so on. Uh, one uh, a head of university museum calls a situation uh, 100 years of solitude because 
uh, they even don't have a possibility to uh, have conversation in uh, the um, colleagues from a public sector, from museum, uh, don't understand their interest, but also their colleagues from uh, uh, university space also d don't understand their interest. So, 100 years of solitude they felt. Um, among, uh, okay. uh, among factors that uh, influenced uh, state self-awareness, uh, you see um, different like uh, statesmen. Um, I mean, the factors that influence positively on the uh, self-consciousness. First one is the, state, uh, the status of museum registered in the system of Ministry of Education or not. And it's really important because in Ukraine we have a situation when, when near, I think, um, 35 PSNs are only registered. Uh, another uh, exists like on a voluntary basis and even uh, they uh, exist, but uh, often they don't have any documentation and so on. Another factor is its allocation of the museum as a full-fledged unit by the university of sorts, when uh, university administration, rector, vice-rector and so on, uh, uh, have uh, like, assured that the museum is a very important institution for promotion uh, in university interest. So it's important and influenced positively. Also, when a collection has um, recognized, uh, recognized on a regional or national level, for example, uh, in Ukraine we have a list of collection of national importance and uh, near 15 collections from university belong to this. Um, of course, the factors that influence positively is the museum experience. How long any person walks in a university museum because probably, and I also compare to my professional experience, when at the beginning I was sure exactly that I'm, I'm more um, university professional and la later it became, I feel myself like a museum professional. So the situation uh, uh, changed. Uh, and their spe specialized education. Uh, I think you agree that um, how, uh, who from you uh, have received a, a specific museological education. I think uh, maybe no one or it's just some of them. So uh, I should mention that uh, uh, professionalists from uh, university museum community are very specific because only uh, some of them or even no one uh, receive a specific professional education and it also influences on our uh, self-identification. Uh, um, Okay, uh, so this question I answered to uh, uh, University Museum professionals, uh, professionals in Ukraine uh, and uh, I've said near 85 percent said that no, I didn't feel myself to go, like uh, uh, University Museum staff and now you can read the answer on, th on these questions uh, and uh, I mentioned it uh, to, before this that uh, uh, for example, at the beginning of our conversation, the person said, oh yes, I, I feel myself like museum. And after uh, such uh, minutes, such 20 or 30 minutes, when uh, we have, when the people understand why I'm here and I just, uh, just really interested about the situation and the situation changed and uh, they uh, gave for me another question, oppositively uh, another question. Uh, so, you see, you see the answers the people uh, sometimes uh, their identification is too unclear they are really uh, between two worlds between universities and between uh, museum uh, another question but uh, another answers of the same um, questions uh, and uh, also uh, people mostly feel uh, themselves uh, like a part of specific department history Geology, University of Sorites, and uh, so on. Uh, I should also mention that uh, such professional meeting, like conference, like another possibilities to grow up, uh, influence positively on uh, self identification. And I also can agree with it because only 
In Kiev, probably 2008, it was organized by Kiev Polytechnic University, some meeting uh, between University of Museum staff and Ukraine. And for me, it was like going when I understood that, or oh, it's a community with, uh, to which I would like to belong it. And later I do a different work, so trying just to, to be engaged in uh, this community. Uh, and so, um, uh, frankly speaking, I, because of such emotional, uh, my, my, uh, my feeling, I didn't plan uh, to visit uh, Wroclaw, but probably four years, four days ago, I understood that I need to be to be here. So thank you for invitation. And um, I've said about it. Uh, and last, like a conclusion about my speech, uh, the vast majority of staff near eight percent of staff don't uh, associate themselves with the community of professional museum. Uh, it's because the public or illegal status, uh, not uh, enough budget, uh, and, and such situation when a um, museum uh, is recognized like a secondary unit by university authorities. I just like mention interesting point. Uh, for several years ago, I was engaged in different project, projects initiated by authorities of the Polytechnic. Uh, it's, uh, the main aim for exposition of local museum uh, and when uh, three years ago, I uh, don't take the situation in last year and this year because it's a uh, years of war. Uh, the authorities have had a greeting for local, uh, for the museum community, but uh, museum staff from Lviv Polytechnic didn't receive any greetings because probably uh, the university authorities didn't recognize themselves like museum staff. So for me it was really uh, interesting just understanding where uh, we are. And uh, so my speech, I think you, uh, you're glad that I'm too, too, too short my conversation. So thank you and um, thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, Gina and um, Silke and Fanny to come here? We'll be standing all together somehow. We'll find a way. <laughs> we need the mic. Can we move the mic? Better like that. Okay. If you want to. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much for these um, very inspiring presentations and um, your candid um, um, comments. Uh, I think uh, all three of you spoke from the heart and uh, you gave us uh, data that uh, we need to reflect on. Uh, with many of, the, of, of what you, much of what you said, I can uh, think similar situations in other universities. And um, what I feel more and more is that the university and the museum uh, of the university, the museums of the university are somehow intimidating institutions. So we need to, um, to reflect on that, how the university can be part of our life, can be more inclusive, so that also the museum that tries to be more inclusive can be more inclusive within the university and in the society. So there is a multi-layer challenge there of inclusivity. Even the belonging you said, how the staff of the museum, of the university museum belongs within the university. And uh, it's a kind of a, an existential um, um, dilemma. Uh, so my first um, uh, question, I will pose one question just to give you time for you to think of your questions, uh, is um, um, the following. Um, how can we reflect more on, on what um, the university brings as citizen science? They talk more and more about citizen science and how we can involve citizens. Um, in our work uh, in the university. Is this a tool? Is this uh, something that we can uh, explore? Or is it just um, another strategic uh, um, firework that uh, can, uh, can light up the, uh, the sky for some time, but it doesn't mean really much? Uh, uh, on the other hand, what I felt from your presentations is that we need to do a lot of um, uh, underground work. We need to do foundational work in order, and that takes time 
and uh, painful changes, but also liberating changes, as you said. Um, so what do we do? What can we do to change without having the media thinking of how fast are we going to change? How fast can they post things in Instagram to show this change? Uh, and at the same time, the university needs to change and become more citizens oriented. Okay. Thank you. That's an absolutely crucial question. Um, in Oxford, we find, and I'm, I'm, Gina may not agree, uh, that it's ultimately a question of winning hearts and minds. Um, and that is often talking to individuals within the university um, to bring them into the work, um, make them part of it, um, to make them passionate advocates. What, I, what we found, um, and we work together as museums, gardens and libraries, um, is that trying to talk to a committee or a group of people often doesn't because nobody feels um, involved directly. Um, so it is a long, it's, it takes time, it doesn't happen overnight, and it can change overnight if there is a new leadership. So we had a new vice chancellor in Oxford at the beginning of the year who puts people before buildings. Now that is very, very encouraging to us. The next vice chancellor may do the opposite, and then um, life becomes far more difficult. Do you want to? Um, yes, definitely change hearts and minds, but. Uh, um, also, the, in my very limited experience with the university, there, are, there is one, things move slowly. On my first four months, I was in such pain that things moved slowly. Now, I can use it, because I know that things move. It's a, it's a blessing that we have, and it took me a while to understand. Because things move slowly, that means we have time to win the hearts and minds. So that is one. Then you're saying, you know, Oxford was at Rome, wasn't built in a day. You know, this is the start of a process, which means if it is not the final outcome, people are more open to, to allow you to, to experiment. And someone, uh, an old professor in Oxford, told me, Zina, if you manage to do something once in Oxford, it becomes a tradition, and then you can do it again. So use, use the environment. That is one. And, Going back to your question about the citizen science, for me, it's multi-level. Again, on my first week in Oxford, one of our keepers asked me, and I was shocked. She said, who do you like, Gina, most? Do you like the public or do you like the academics? And I genuinely couldn't answer the question because I had never, I don't like, I like all of them and I don't like any of them. It's all in equal measures. It doesn't, they are all, we are all people. So it's using different avenues to, to get the, 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 the university in. I care a lot, I have I've started, I've learned to care a lot about our university. Um, someone calls them the academic public, I don't like the term, the, the, university, the people in the university, because I don't think in a very colonial and patronizing way that they make the most of our museums. And that hurts me. So the same way that we are trying to be inclusive with communities, and I, I agree with everything that um, um, Silke said, that we cannot drop communities and pick them up. If we start something, we have to have a measure of success. And is it in two, three years, these communities feel um, empowered to use our spaces, or is the measure of success that we will some people that would not normally visit will visit one, and that is enough. Decide what we want. So work with different, in different ways with different people. Hi, dear friends. I uh, do really would like to say the same. Oh, I repeat with my dear colleagues. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have now in the Ukrainian museum community in general and university Ukrainian museum community, we have another challenges, but probably um, one, my idea, not only my, but just uh, I agree with it. Uh, of course, uh, we need, uh, uh, it, it will be uh, necessary to make a total exposition in the whole museum, uh, not only uh, university and in general, but uh, probably we need time to, to reflect about it and uh, don't uh, when our emotions make 
wave. So, so it's. I would like just to say thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Um, any questions from the public or comments, observations? Yes, Roland. Yes, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I've discussed this with Silke before and also about the case of Oxford. I mean, we just put in, a, you know, with JC, a research uh, proposal to do a collaborative work. I mean, me living in India, not only living in India, but also having an Indian family, right? Like that partly actually lives in the UK and is part of the, you can say the immigrant, one of the immigrant communities, but then you find out this problem is immensely co complex, right? Like, and if you think a little bit about it, obviously, uh, why should it not be? I mean, if you just say about Islamic, right? Like, that's such a complex thing. And even how would you box it, right? If you say the South Asian community is 18% Islamic, I don't know about the immigrant community, but would you place them as South Asian? Would you place them as Islamic? Who would like to be represented by who? Right? Like, most of my Indian family doesn't want to be represented by the Indian expat community, right? So it's uh, so I think the only the only thing that we really have, and it's not a pro it, it cannot be it cannot be a product. It needs to be a process. Is a constant dialogue, and also taking obviously, and that's the thing. Also, Oxford is obviously at the heart of these power relations. Oxford is actually a part of creating difference, right? Like it's at the heart, at the center of creating difference, and also creating hierarchies also within these immigrant communities, right? Like there is very powerful, again, South Asian scholars who work at Oxford, who define, who actually are defining, for example, the historiography of science in India, right? Like historiography of science in India, I mean, the scholarly accepted one is not made in India, it's made in Oxford and some, or Oxford, Cambridge, and some elite universities in the US, right? So very, very much, and this is kind of what we need to engage with, and what we also need to deconstruct, who's talking on who's behalf here, right? And obviously if in India, like you have now a South Asian prime minister, right? Like which obviously doesn't solve the problem of immigration at all, right? Like in the UK and you see that it's, it's, it's a much more complex thing to tackle and to see what is our role as a university in this, but also being very self-critical as an institution, how much we are part of these at, at the core, right? Like they're very powerful, Oxford is a very powerful institution for this. Thank you, Roland, for summarizing so beautifully what I was trying to say. Um, that is precisely the point. Um, because we're always, whoever, whoever we talk to, talk to representatives. Whoever comes to whatever we offer are some people of a much larger group. Now, bear in mind, I'm an immigrant to Oxford myself. Yeah? So nobody has ever invited me to be included. Um, and that is, that is the point. Um, the whole idea of inclusion and participation sounds wonderful in an ICOM document. But in reality, it's something which is really, really complex. It's something which we have to tread extremely carefully. Because otherwise, we do far more damage than we do good. And that is what is so problematic. Um, Gina said, is a measure of success if whatever the community is we will work with, that in future they see this as our four museums as their museums and they come into Rembrandt as the Sikh community didn't, uh, well, didn't feel comfortable at the V&A at the time. Or is it a measure of success that we can report some statistics to somebody? And that, the latter, is still far too much the issue. And this is a deeply, deeply human question. And a deeply human question should never become just a statistic. And that is why, from the reflection we have on our projects, that saying we are inclusive and being truly inclusive, whatever that means, is light years from each other. And that is something we have to bear in mind before we enter. Don't start it without knowing where you want it to end, is, is the reflection from us. Thank you very much, Roland, for this um, <laughs> very key question, but also your comments. And uh, um, the challenge here is really to be human-centered in the museum. And I think the museums are very well placed, even the university museum is even more, very well placed to create this safe space between communities and uh, a knowledge uh, space. 
but uh, they are also uh, very much loaded with uh, labels, literally and symbolically, that museums create a lot of um, etiquette uh, rules that we need to deconstruct and start from scratch. Uh, and these changes are not easy. So one last question uh, I can take from the floor. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And I'm, I'm trying to get my head around what we're talking about today and, well, obviously the next couple of days. And correct me if I'm wrong, is it all coming down to trust? Is the question how to get trust, whether it's from the museum communities that you're working with that you want to embark on a journey with or whether it's with the outside communities that you want to work with because one of the challenges that you were mentioning was people not coming on board or people feeling as though um, they are not going to be or their knowledge is not going to be appreciated they're going to look like fools etc etc so it all comes down to trust in some ways and how do you get people's trust and we go down to human relationships here in some way so that's just a question i wanted to put in in some ways no. Thank you. For me, it's more complicated than trust. And um, I, I mean, I am also an immigrant in, uh, in the UK from the age of 18, but I now, London is my home. So, but because I'm interested in communities, uh, as a Greek Orthodox, I do things for the cathedral. I am a trustee in the Jewish Museum in London, the first non-Jewish trustee. And I'm also a governor in a school with 99% Muslim near my home in London. I commute to Oxford. So, uh, what, uh, and I did, I'm doing that because I'm interested. And what I'm discovering is that there isn't a clear path of creating trust because even, we, and I can speak with the Greek community because I'm not going to offend anyone but Margaret. And it's within the Greek um, communities in London, there is an homogeneity and there are uh, rivalries and there are uh, power. So there isn't necessarily trust within the community. So as an outsider, when you're trying to build trust with a community you don't know, it's even harder. And what we, what we have found in the Asmolian is not having one gatekeeper, but ha having as many multiple voices even from that community being present and being present within um, with with museum professionals and it's, it's not easy because you see the you see the politics playing and you don't always understand them uh, and if i give a good example and i know i'm a, i am um, i'm not a community that has ever been invited to a museum but in the asmoli and our colleagues we have a, an exhibition about Knossos uh, in Crete. And what has been uh, incredible is how our curator worked with um, our colleagues in Crete. And when they came over, and again, they felt that it wasn't like the Parthenon Marbles, the British Museum that had been disputed again and again, but no one minded that these artifacts were in the Asmolian of the way that they were presented. And then how our curator worked with the, the Greek Filias Molian to make to and use us in order to reach the, the people in the UK, well in England, of Greek heritage to visit the exhibition. So it's again making the most of the networks that exist. I would like to add that uh, it, for me it's mostly about the um, possibility when museums represent different sets of community which it belongs to. And also when, uh, he, uh, when it realizes different projects, it should be only with cooperation with uh, voices from such community. Not only express, but uh, different uh, people from such community. It, uh, and uh, in such way the museum will be interesting if, for, for it. Thank you. Let me just add one point to go back to your question. I think it's all about trust. And it's not just trust building with other communities. It starts with trust in myself. Do I really believe that this is what I want to do? 
Do I have the trust that I can carry this through, even if I get a lot of criticism? Am I willing to put my job on the line as I have done because I trust myself that this is what I want to do? Only if I have that can I build trust with others. And therefore, I would say you are absolutely right. It's all about trust and it's all about humans. Thank you very, very much. This has been wonderful. A lot of um, um, you know, uh, ideas and uh, experiences spoken from experience and from the heart. A lot to take with us in the next sessions. Thank you very much. I know that we ne need to rush for the next session now. So the floor is to my next colleague. <laughs> the, floor is, the floor is for Jay now. She's a very strict timekeeper, so please follow her. Don't make her angry. It's working, I think, I hope. Yeah, only to summarize what uh, our colleague said, responsibility after trust, we think. Uh, infrastructure that we need every day, courage that we need every day. Yeah. Can you ask the question whether the people hear you correctly? Just hear them. Do you hear me? <laughs> yes, there you are. Okay, so once again, uh, we are out of time, but everything is important. Uh, so important is the second part of this first session by and for whom we explore and uh, experience our academical heritage. Um, as I said uh, before, after trust, the responsibility that we have every time, every day, in every decision that we make together or individual infrastructure that we build together as a network, as a network inside of our institutions, as individual uh, actors of our city. Courage, we need the courage uh, every day. Of course, uh, these actions and type of courage are also different uh, in our cases. People, we here and everywhere in our departments, institutions, uh, this all is about people uh, and about communication between them and between the past and the future. And one thing at the end, but is first of all, the time. We need time, but we have every time not so much time for our work and activities. So now we are presenting, thanks to our colleagues, uh, another part of activities. We will go through, um, I think, different areas of sustainability, well-being, communication, uh, awareness and building of awareness and different types of actions. So I would like to uh, invite the face, uh, first speaker, Frederic, yeah? uh, and we will hear about experience um, of curation and using uh, of collections uh, during teaching and innovative curation. So we have five minutes for this presentation. Excuse me, I cannot see my, my folder anymore. Um, nice to meet you, by the way. Okay, find it. Thank you. I found it. <laughs> okay, so that's going to be my five minutes, I think. <laughs> so it seems to be an update and so on. Okay. Do you uh, say full screen in Polish? Ah, doesn't mean what? Do you know how to? Uh, oh, it's, I think you can see them. So, but I think it's going to be okay.
like this. Yeah. No, doesn't matter. I think it's going to be fine, right? Okay, so that was my five minutes. Thank you for your attention. So um, I'm Frederick Brechtenmacher. I'm a historian of science, and um, so being a university professor, I'm certainly interested in um, historical collections. Um, I don't know if it would qualify me as a museum professional in Ukraine, uh, but I hope so. But also, I have to keep an eye on students. So uh, I would like to, in this talk, uh, share with you uh, some reflections about um, students' experience of uh, historical collections um, in teaching initiatives based on a direct contact with uh, these collections. And since our museum at Ecole Polytechnique is fairly recent, I would like to uh, discuss what was going on before the creation of this museum and after. So, uh, a few words about the collections of Ecole Polytechnique uh, and their connections with uh, student activities in the long run. Just to highlight the diversity uh, as this, it, these pictures allude to. So, of course, there are some um, scientific instruments and uh, artifacts, but also costumes, and weapons, um, drawings, paintings, engravings, photographs, and so on. So the collections are very diversified, and so the museum is not limited to a history of science museum, but uh, sheds a very peculiar light on the relations between science and societies in the long run. So actually, the, the historical connections have been associated with teaching since their origin, uh, so they were uh, initiated at the creation of the school in 1784 uh, in order to promote science activities and experiments for students. Uh, and it's only in the 1970s when the school was moved in the suburbs of Paris to a brand new campus that the students were in a way cut off the historical collections which were then, uh, then limited to uh, researchers. Uh, until 2012 when we started to develop um, teaching initiatives project-oriented approaches, uh, especially to teach history, history of science and technology, based on the collections. So collections were in contact with students again, uh, have been since uh, 2012, and eventually we opened a physical museum in 2018, which of course raised new issues regarding the public and um, uh, issues um, of the student project. So, the student project uh, basically aimed at having the student being in contact with a uh, various set of collections of archives. But there's outcomes of the project. Results, things made by the students, such as research papers, exhibitions, documentary films, and so on. And for quite a while, these um, outcomes were uh, limited to uh, academic issues and, of course, students themselves, fellow students or future students who would like to work on similar sets of collections. So, for instance, this is a prototype of the electric mother from the beginning of the 20th century that a student managed to uh, work on and have it work in the end. It was not a piece of cake because it involved mercury, so it involved the chemistry lab and so on. So all of the, these things are very interesting, but maybe not very appealing to uh, a large audience. Even though all these works have played a, an important role in the preservation of certain specific collections, such as collections of ancient films and videos that were threatened uh, because they didn't uh, take part of the of the official historical collections of the school. So a group of students made a documentary film about this uh, collection to raise awareness uh, for the preservation among the administration of the school. A group of alumni raised money and so on. So um, these works actually, even back then, uh, participated to uh, the creation of the collections, their preservations, and actually they played quite an important role in the creation of a physical museum in 2018. So, since 2018 now we have a museum, so of course we can open the collections to other groups than researchers, professors and uh, students. So at least we have one visitor at least here. And so this raises, of course new uh, issues for the student projects. So it opened new spaces and, okay, so I, I thought you counted the, the time of the, okay, 
never mind. Uh, it opened new spaces for special exhibitions, so this is a little bit obvious, both of art and science, but also uh, connecting experimentations on ancient collections, such as reproduction of uh, Prussian blue pigments, uh, as you can see them following the notebooks of Gedrick-Sack Laboratory. This was done quite recently. But more importantly, it opened new perspectives uh, about the, the public, and so the students had to reflect about uh, the audience, and they were very eager to uh, reflect on that and develop um, uh, especially digital modernizations and videos of uh, instruments. So maybe I can show it to you, or maybe not. So this is going to ruin my, my one minute left. So this is a mnemonic analyzer, a Coradi analyzer. It allows to compute the first Fourier coefficient uh, of a mathematical curve. And so one of the most immediate um, initiatives taken by the students were to uh, modelize this kind of instruments so that they can address a larger audience than fellow students and academics. So as I have very little time uh, remaining, uh, just to highlight something else. So uh, this time, students conducted surveys and wanted to test uh, uh, what the targeted audience, such as high school students, for instance, uh, uh, how they would experience uh, this kind of mediation device. And they uh, found out that actually um, um, the, the digital modernization uh, was something that was a little bit limited. And so, with the same instruments, based on the former work of the students you've seen just before. We have now students who um, managed to reproduce it physically with a 3D printer so that uh, the visitors of the museum can manipulate it uh, during their visits. Um, so I had many other things I could uh, talk about. Oh, 20 minutes remaining? <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Jake, thank you for your speech, and uh, definitely uh, I, I would invite, I think, to, to prepare the presentation next speaker or speakers. Uh, we will hear about, uh, yeah, here, so please, uh, uh, the floor will be yours in, uh, in a moment. Uh, so, uh, still interpretation and uh, finding of new methodolo methodolo methodological show, sorry, issues with, uh, to use our collections. Maybe new technologies will be helpful in this area um, and the, in the area of, um, and in, in the way how we can activate our students. So the floor is yours, five minutes for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mara Fauzone, I work in the Scientific and Technological Archives of the University of Turin and I speak to you about this project with my colleagues uh, of the uh, Polytechnics. Uh, in the last uh, few years, the Italian, the Italian University have uh, expanded their activities beyond the traditional areas in teaching and research. Many activities of public engagement and third mission have led uh, knowledge for the social, cultural and economical development of the community. Um, in uh, 2002, yes. um, the University of Turin funded a project named Vicini, that means neighbors, uh, to bring a wide audience closer to scientific knowledge. And for the first time, the historical buildings of the City of the Science of Turin um, uh, inaugurated at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it is the venues uh, of uh, scientific institutes uh, even working today, uh, such as anatomy, physiology, pathology, physics, chemistry, pharmaceutical chemistry, and uh, environmental health have opened to the public for two days. Uh, there were educational programs for school, uh, laboratories and uh, ancient libraries guided tours. In this uh, place uh, were many men of science in the past, uh, work and students following the positivist thought. 
In the same time, we had uh, imagined the possibility of uh, an engaging exhibition, the collaboration of uh, two universities uh, of Turin led to a good result. For the first time, the historical and scientific collection of both institutions were displayed in dialogue with one another, focusing on the role of Turin as a city of science between the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. The exhibition took place uh, in the Valentino Castle in uh, Turin, seat of the School of Architecture, from uh, November 2022 to January 2023. The title was uh, uh, Public Affairs, Health, Work and Society in the Historical Collection of the University and Polytechnic of Turin. The focus was the development of science and technology, and we paid attention to health, work and society, and we organized a guided tour too. Um, by focusing on health, we explained the development of sewerage system, public water supply, vaccination program, and the new discoveries in medicine as the sphygmo manometer for the uh, measure of the blood pressure invented in Turin by Scipione Rivarocci. Um, Work-wise, we uh, pay attention to the safety in the workplace, for example, miners involved in the excavation of tunnels in the Alps, the invention of instruments, the development of technologies like electrical motors by Galileo Ferraris, and the reduction of the working time. Uh, by focusing on the society, um, we analyze the possibility for people uh, to have uh, council houses and the improvements uh, in agriculture uh, to produce uh, Food for everyone. All these factors have laid the foundation for a fairer and inclusive society. Here you can see the image of the uh, room, the hall where we have the exhibition. And uh, the sex of the event as a prompted discussion of creating a shared collection and archives repository between the two universities to encourage a long-lasting dialogue around historical themes and contemporary challenges. University and Polytechnic have a very large historical collection. Manader has a seat where setting up a permanent exhibition. We hope to obtain soon a place where we can arrange all instruments and tell the history of our important heritage. Thank you. Perfect timing and the next uh, presentation and interesting title is Pigment Yourself, a project by and for students. Uh, the previous presentation, interesting topic when we talk about the cooperation between uh, universities and cities and culture uh, from universities and uh, cities, um, how we can use it. So, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joanna. So, I will sit like Marta. So uh, from Turin we go to Brussels and I will present you a, prog a project from, from students and for students. So it was supposed to do that at least. Oh my God, what's that? Marek, please help me. Ah, okay. Uh, so for new students of this, of last year, uh, were asked to organize a project for the uh, ULB, so the University of Brussels Museums Network. So it was one of their courses of the Master in Cultural Management. So they are there, as you can see. So an ID card of the event. 
So they had to do many things. So they were supposed to do many things and they had to be uh, ready for the, the event itself on May, the last, uh, the 11th of May for a nocturne. So it was a challenge for them, but also for us, it was at the Botanical Garden of our university. The program, there were uh, some, um, some uh, on a set schedule, so some uh, visits and so on, and the concert at the end of the event with light show. And during all the event, there were all, all, um, other activities like the one of the museums, the, the, the stand of the museums. And the museums were um, linked with the, the theme called pigments. Uh, somebody was talking about pigments just before. So here it was the main theme. So we had uh, many uh, stakeholders. And we had challenges because we had to be part of a, a larger program organized by an association of the museums in Brussels. So they organized the nocturnes each year. And the other main challenge for the students and for us was to have the agreement of the, um, the public authority who manage the botanical garden because the university is only organizing activities inside the garden, but it, it doesn't manage it. So before the, the D-Day, we had many um, challenges. You have a list. I will not, of course, uh, explain all of them, but I've put some in, um, in a big character. And so you can see the first thing was it to divide and to organize the students, but they had to do that by themselves. And then after that, they had to deal with different partners. First of all, of course, the museums and the network, and they had to choose and to propose or to suggest and to organize a flagship activity. That flagship activity was the concert I was talking before, about before. For the, the museum, the network, and for me particularly, of course, there, there were new students and they were not students as usual. So I, I had many uh, things to do to, to be well and to have good communications with them. And uh, the museums, my colleagues, they had to suggest contacts and ideas to enhance the program, uh, a part of the concert. So that's, well, that was before the day. On the day, of course, they, they, we, we uh, share uh, challenges like the weather. And as you can see on the picture, it was not so good. The presence of all partners involved, because there were many, and were with the public. So we had also our own challenges, and the students had their own. So, and the, the main was that they had to coordinate everything because I was not there. I just broke my feet the day before. So they had to manage it for me. And they had to do it with my colleagues. So after that, they had to uh, uh, give me back a report and they, do, they did a SWOT. As you can see in the SWOT, they've put students in experience in the weaknesses, poor distribution of tasks between them, poor internal communication between them and also with the, the museums. And they had problems to uh, manage the formalities, the deadlines, and they think that they were a small group, they were four. Usually, we do, it, we do that with two people. Huh? Uh, but, in fact, I will see you briefly the ULB Museum Network uh, challenges. So you can see students' poor responses, low students' creativity, and so on. So we had to manage students who are not, I'm not uh, familiar with that kind of students. You will see this afternoon other kind of students uh, here. Uh, so, but people were there. So they had to focus on the students' public. The students' public was an, the half of the public coming to the event. But in fact, that public, that students who came to the event are their friends, were their friends, the friends of the organizers. Uh, they was, of course, um, they came mainly for the concert and not for the museum's activities. 
So for us, it was not really a success. So you, ca you can see many things on the slide, but I have to stop because Marek will, will beat me. So um, my, my, I, I didn't understand during a long time why those students didn't work like, like usual. And so I wonder why. And I think maybe it's because the students today is not only a student, is also a, a, a worker, is also an activist, is also a spectator, is also an artist because we are in cultural management. And so they have agenda like ministers, in fact. And when they have to do project inside the courses, they have to choose and, and maybe they just keep it for the end and then they just work in the stress situation and so the museums and the teachers also are stressed with that kind of new students but fortunately all of them are not like that as uh, you you will see this afternoon so that's what my small impression thank you thank you natalie i think the important part uh it, in what you said is this analysis uh, that you made. So you checked what went good and what went wrong in this project to, to, to have the better knowledge about uh, the process. Okay, the last but last not least uh, in this part of the session uh, is another part of activities and uh, Hubert will present us the activity of uh, University Museum and University in uh, Warsaw and uh, how they helped Ukrainian refugees. Thank you. Uh, this is the story not only about helping, uh, because uh, in general from the beginning of the war we are we are, all are helping, yes, uh, still, nowadays also. But this is the question and this is the story about the visibility of the University Museum, because you know exactly as I am that we've got the same problems, that usually our organizers, they don't see the museum as the main point of interest, yes, from the perspective of the university. So, it's uh, hard to find our way but sometimes we can. It's, of course, good timing and uh, idea. And it turned out that the University Museum can be really useful for the university in this case. You can see the numbers, and the numbers are dramatic because it goes uh, in millions of people uh, that crossed our border. And many of them stayed also. So it means, of course, that the help uh, which is from the beginning, uh, it was directed into, to take care of the people, to try to find a, a place, uh, resources for living, etc. But afterwards, it turned out that the people that are in Poland, uh, is in Poland, in Warsaw, they need to do something, yes? Because it's like normal, they try to survive and try to live normally. So our university, uh, began almost from the beginning uh, a project as any other universities uh, in Poland I think what we can do what we can uh, how we can proceed with the Ukrainians here for example with the language courses etc and uh, we also as the museum mm, helped at the beginning with the things like that but uh, when there is so many people, it means that there is also money involved. So the university, in this case, the museum wasn't fundraiser, not we, but the university. So the huge amount of money came into the university structure. And it turned out that, uh, you know, when you got a research uh, grant for Department of Physics, Department of Chemistry, it's not a problem to, to proceed with the, with the money, yes? But when uh, there is a situation uh, when the culture things are on the, uh, uh, on the table, then it's uh, hard to proceed with, the, um, with, uh, with this help. So it turned out that the museum is a quite good platform, uh, as we can treat it as a hub, for helping uh, university to do this all 
kind of situations uh, to help the Ukrainians, like workshops, workshops like culture, uh, mm, uh, like uh, exhibitions, like concerts, everything you, you can think about uh, which is connected to the culture. Okay, at the university, it turned out that the university museum can be a real partner for the university. So, since uh, it, it, uh, it took already one year, we are proceeding with different cultural situation. Because, why? Because usually this is our job. We are connected to the, for example, Department of Archaeology, yes? Department of History. Because usually we are making uh, connections with these departments because we do these things, yes? So it's not a problem for us to take people from archaeology department and we can do some workshop with the pottery, yes? You can create yourself some kind of vase, etc. We can call anyone from the uh, history department and they can do a tour, not only at the university, within the university campus, but also in Warsaw. It's not a problem, you know, to call anyone from the Academy of uh, Fine Arts and we can do some uh, drawing lessons. It's not a problem to call our dancers, yes, or our choir, and they can teach how to dance or how to sing. If we are making and producing any concert, this is a possibility also to gather all together. Uh, this is an example of uh, our uh, tours. But it means that through this year, uh, we really uh, got connected to thousands of people. Okay, and we are still doing it. Even the rector is uh, very interested in this situation. Because it turned really, it turned out that we can play uh, an important role within the university. Mm, for example, with the situation with the Ukrainian artists, mm, and also with auctions. Uh, and what I can say, this is just an example. And as I said before, uh, oh, it's not only our friends from our other departments. It's also the situation. Look that the. Uh, these are the drawings from our collection. So anyway, the collection is also involved in the process. And uh, I think this is very important for the Academic Museum to, to, to play this kind of role. And now I can say we are very useful for the university. And just like a brief story. Thank you. Robert, please stay with us because I would like to invite other speakers and we will summarize this part of the session. Please come to, uh, come to me uh, all. And I have a uh, reflection after these presentations. Uh, they were short, synthetic, but really fruitful. And I think really complementary because they uh, show us that there is not anymore the question that we are trying to ask uh, why and what for. We only ask when and how. <laughs> so uh, your presentation, different activities, uh, one mission to support and to uh, secure different areas, tangible, intangible, to communicate, to deal together with university, for university, uh, with community, for community. So as we see and what you shown with your perspectives and with your experience, there is, I think, no more the question uh, if we are needed for university. We are part of the universities, of different universities. We like to be in the universities, even with, when we have uh, some difficulties and problems. And your presentations and before uh, and in the first sessions, I think uh, they've shown us that we ask questions, but not to find the answer if someone wants us, but we ask questions how to be more active, how to be more supportive, how to be more um, experienced, because these experiences uh, help us a lot. 
And we back to the first session in the sense that we said that all is about the people, because it is for people, for our communities, uh, local communities, universities, communities, local communities, European communities, worldwide communities. So, uh, if someone of our guests have some question or want to summarize and reflection after this session, would you want to ask something? Because the time was short, but maybe you want to add something more. Hmm? No, everything's fine. So I think it was really, really uh, fruitful and inspiring. And I think it helped us to discuss later. And uh, yeah, we need to uh, use new methods, new techniques, and still communicate to build awareness, but we need to remember that we are important part of our universities and other types of uh, schools in higher education. Thank you for the session, and we invite all our guests to the lunch. Yeah, I'm looking for Ursula. <laughs> yes, Ula is telling me that now is a uh, break for lunch. Thank you very much for the session. Thank you.
There are still people in the hall. Hello. 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 <laughs> Please, Please come in. Join us. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to start because, um, as you all know, we're running um, a little short on time by now. <laughs> so I'm also not going to do a really long introduction um, because we have two 15-minute papers after the, in this session. Uh, the session is called Experience Difficult Heritage, and the first two speakers will uh, talk about uh, colonial history, about the colonial heritage, which is a very important subject for um, at least some of the European countries. Um, in, the, in the last years, there's been a, um, a lot of talk about restitution and, and, and um, colonial heritage has been seen in that light. I think uh, the interesting thing in this session is that we'll see two examples that will go more into other aspects of how to deal with this um, past and the connection with the university. So, uh, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, who is Neil Curtis from the University of Aberdeen, and he will talk about exhibiting the legacies of slavery in the University of Aberdeen. The floor is yours, uh, Neil. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks, Jen Kui. So, I've what I want to do is to talk about an exhibition that is running in Aberdeen just now. It would be lovely if people came to visit. Um, and this came out of a project that's been running for now two and a half years um, and about the legacies of slavery in the university and in the northeast of Scotland. And I think one important point to start with is that that project was basically driven by um, those of us in museums and special collections. It didn't come from an academic department. But what we were able to do was we, we were able to get a, an, a lecturer, an academic post created, who is a lecturer in the history of slavery. And for two years, he's done a research project looking at the history of slavery in the university and in the entire region, because it's not something you can separate the institution from the region. And the, and the provisional conclusion of that is twofold. One is a paper that's going to the university senior management team about what we should do, and the other is the exhibition that's open just now. So I'm going to focus on, on the exhibition. So um, I'm not going to show you all of it, just, this is just the, the opening view of it. Um, and this has been co-curated by that lecturer in the history of slavery, working with uh, the museums and special collections teams. So it's very much our view of the story, and I'd emphasize, we are all white people who are telling this story. So what we're doing is telling a first step to let people know about the legacy of slavery in Aberdeen and then to get them thinking in lots of different ways about what the next step should be. Um, and one of the important starting points was that people tend to think of um, the history of slavery as being something that is facing the Atlantic that connects Africa, um, the Caribbean, the United States, and the western part of the British Isles. Um, so in Scotland, a big emphasis on Glasgow. And so what we were wanting to say is, there is an Aberdeen story, and it's a different story. So we were locating that story in a very specific place. This isn't a, a general exhibition about the history of slavery. It's specifically about the University of Aberdeen and the region. So, um, these are a couple of the, the introductory panels um, and the text in italics through this are all words taken from the exhibition. So Aberdeen and its region were heavily involved in racial slavery. We've tried just to say it as it is and I'll come on to that. It's a fairly small exhibition, maybe it's about a third of the size of, the, of this room we're in. Um, and we discussed a lot what structure we'd follow. And one initial thought is one, the, the more conventional one, is one that does it um, chronologically. Um, and that was the one that was taken in the past, which ends with abolition, emancipation, the end of slavery. And instead, what we, we were doing was we wanted to start with enslavement 
and end with now. And so what are we doing in the present day? Slavery has been abolished, but there still is a legacy. And we also wanted to try to focus the story on the people who had been enslaved rather than the stories of the people who were the enslavers. So the exhibition opens um, about enslavement, Aberdeen and slavery, um, then moves to the Caribbean and talks about what was happening there, including, as you can see, these are the headings of the exhibition. Um, so enslavers from the Northeast, resistance, emancipation. So trying to tell these different stories. And then the exhibition moves on to here about the Northeast um, and the debate in abolition and the profits that were made from slavery. And then finally round to now and how we respond to this today. The language that we used in the exhibition was really important um, because there are lots of the words used have deep meanings and we talked earlier on today about othering, that the dangers you talk about slaves as they're not really people. So that's why we talked about them as people who were enslaved, that sort of language. Um, we also wanted to, to make sure, although this is an exhibition being put on by the university museums in the university, um, we've tried to be, the, a colleague gave me, gave me the word, said it was quite detached that we were just trying to say, this is what happened. It's not meant to be polemic. We're not meant to be trying to you know, use emotive language to con convert people. We weren't trying to cover things by uh, you know, using polite language. We just tried to say it as it is. So this is the opening text in the exhibition, talking about people being brutally enslaved, trafficked, used as forced labor, and killed. That was the opening text. And it carries on quite like that, very, very bold language. Um, and as it says, the final paragraph there, it's a first step in revealing that story. So this is, and it's not actually the first step, it's very much our first step, it's an early step that other people have been doing things. But this was us offering this story for other people to then engage with and think about. The things we have on show are all drawn from the university collections and it was one of the things that was so astonishing was how much material there was that we were able to display material in the museum collections in the archives the rare books collections um, and we also as you can see I mean, this is a range of some of them things that were given by people who profited from slavery and then up in the top right there's a placard that was used in a black lives matter protest in aberdeen um, so we brought in some other additional things, but there were good original items on display. It wasn't secondary material. And we wanted to focus on whose story were we, were we telling. It was we who were telling the story, but we are not the important bit of the story. Um, and this meant that some of the most dramatic items, I mean, there's a, um, a painting you can just see on one of the graphic panels there, which is a portrait of Professor Beatty, who was a noted abolitionist in, in Aberdeen, painted by Joshua Reynolds, who was a really high profile artist in London. We didn't want to show the original of that because we would have had an enormous white man dominating the wall. And we didn't have portraits of the enslaved people to balance that. So we tried to bring him down into this panel. And then we used an illustration from a book of Equiano. Um, who was a black man campaigning against slavery. So trying to balance those so we had a more even story that we were telling. And then we moved um, into the now. And fortunately here, we were able to include um, a performance piece that had been put together by two local people, um, one a poet and the other a ceramic artist. And the poet performed her, her piece in front of a gateway I'll tell you about in the next slide. Um, and the ceramicist um, had a little plaque. And this was taking one of the names of the people who'd been enslaved. We only knew their name from a list of people. And they tried to give her some personality, gave her an imaginary existence. So we were then able just to bring that sense of imagined life into, into play. This video was done for Aberdeen Art Gallery, which is not part of the university, but we worked really closely with them. So we were able to show the video um, in the exhibition. So to move into the, the final section, the now, um, we don't have 
a statue to an enslaver in Aberdeen to, to pull over or to spray paint on or to do anything with. And clearly some people in Aberdeen really wanted one, but we didn't have one. Um, what we do have is this gateway. It's now owned by the university. Um, it wasn't at the time. It was built as the entrance to a big, big house. Um, but this was built the year after the abolition of slavery by a family who were given a huge amount of money when slavery was abolished. So it really is clearly made with the profits of slavery, unambiguous. And so this became the physical location for protests in Aberdeen. It belongs to the university. So one thing we did was we worked with the city council and we had a, a plaque made. They have plaques that I tell you about places and ones about people. This is a places plaque. And you know, I'll just, I'll read it because you probably can't read it at the back. Um, Powys Gateway was built in the early 1830s by the Leslie family using profits from slavery. The Leslies, the lairds of nearby Powys House, owned an estate in Jamaica on which they forced enslaved African people to work. After the 1833 Act for the Abolition of Slavery, the Leslies received government compensation, which also helped fund the gateway. The formerly enslaved people received nothing for their years of unpaid labor and suffering. So we really tried to say, you know, this is as it is. Um, and it, you know, it's been there, we've not seen it vandalized. It's, um, there, there was one person tweeted, they were quite annoyed we put it up because it was their hidden fact about the university they could tell on tours. And we've now told the story publicly, so it's not a secret story anymore. Um, that's 70 words. This is a complex story. We are getting now, we've got planning permission to put up a graphic panel um, which will give a richer story of about 250 words. And for this, we've discussed more with the Aberdeen University Students Association and we're working very closely with them. And it's the first time that we've been able to work closely with the Students Association because they're really interested in what we're doing. Um, and a number of them came out of anti-racist activity and that's how they've got that political profile. So we're now best of friends in this, it's tremendous. And so they've been involved helping to write the panel and they've devised a tour of campus about colonialism and slavery. So it's like I stop them outside a coffee shop and say, coffee, tea, chocolate, what's the history of that? It's so embedded in everything we're doing. The exhibition ends with um, a wall for people to put comments on. Um, it's not strictly true. They put them in a box and we then put them up. So the ones that are offensive don't go up. We are putting up ones that we don't like. It's not a censoring thing, but there is, there is a bit of, there are people who are, say, you know, who are liable to say you know, offensive things, um, would swear and so on. So we're a wee bit of control there. Um, now, I had hoped to be able to you know, read some of them, but um, you know, most of them are really positive. Um, I mean, the one in the middle want this kind of exhibition more. That's fine, a bit anodyne. Um, lived in 20 years in Aberdeen and didn't know about this, this aspect of history in the city. We had quite a few of those. Um, other ones, the exhibition is a positive start, but there should be financial reparations. So it's, yeah, this is a bit performative unless you do something more. That's actually what we wanted. And so finally, last slide, um, the report, the historical report is going to the university senior management team on Monday. And we've arranged that the, the senior management team, that's the principal, the vice principals, the ones who are responsible for running the university, are all going to visit the exhibition before they discuss what to do. This wasn't the original plan. The original plan is they do this, they do that, and one of the things they'd say was, let's have an exhibition. But we decided not to wait and just to do the exhibition as part of that considering the legacy. So um, I don't know what's gonna happen. We've recommended various things. I've fuzzed them out so you can't see them because it's a confidential university document just now. But we are thinking about the money that the university still has as money that it can choose what to do, that you can trace back to slavery. There are other things about the reputation, the heritage that are much bigger. What do we do with them? They're not something you can deal with next year. It's taken us 200 years to get here. 
This is not, not a something you can solve. This is a long-term issue. Heritage, legacy are all really powerful things. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Very interesting. Um, I'd like to invite the next speakers, I must say. Uh, they are... Um, can you pronounce your last name? Kazalaid. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mariana Broom, and I don't recall your first name, Montero. Fabi. Yeah. Um, they, will <laughs> they will talk. The title of their presentation is How Far Can We Go in Decolonizing Astronomy Collections? Which is a very interesting take, I think. And um, they will have 15 minutes, uh, just as Neil did, but they need some time to change speakers. So let's be a little bit gentle on them. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so our presentation is divided in three parts. The first, we'll talk about scientific instruments, then surveying and map making, and cartography. Um, our objectives are to find good practices and inspirational case studies to engage in a decolonial approach of the interpretation of the astronomical collection across all activities, and also to think critically and deconstruct the persistent reproduction of colonial narratives and the words in use. We have more, but I just follow. We were inspired in international guidelines on decolonization. We have looked at ICOM, at German Museum Association and the UK Museums Association, a group of museums from the Netherlands, Belgium Restitution, and also the University of Glasgow. And currently, there is a Portuguese, there is debate about these in Portuguese universities. Uh, there was this Transmat meeting in Lisbon and Evora. Uh, in Coimbra, we were celebrating our 10 years of UNESCO nomination, and we had an invitation to Laura Jane Smith to come and talk to us about these issues. And also, the University of Porto was doing some meeting and debate about visual culture and repair. And our departing point was the declaration of discomfort of the Ontario Museum of Glasgow University. And I just quote um, the science behind them, the science behind the instrument, in this case, uh, Hadley's um, um, octant or quadrant. Uh, was used as part of the justification of Europeans' racial superiority. And this was our departing point. We want to de deconstruct the epic narrative promoted by the Estado Novo, which was the dictatorship that prevails still in Portuguese culture and the, in the architecture of the Coimbra campus. It is about the glorification of the figure of Prince Henry the Navigator, and I just quote, uh, he executed these grandiose plans, discovery of sea routes, contacts with faraway and strange peoples. Uh, these charts represented also human types, lands and their peoples, either to unrecorded, were brought under the light of history and into mutual interchange, bringing them in closer relationship and the Portuguese vigorous and friendly guidance. This is the prevailing idea, of course. So we decided to focus on collections with a colonial connection, navigating instruments such as astrolabes, quadrants, octants, sextants, and we selected the more symbolic instrument of the ocean voyages, the Portuguese Mariner Astrolab, that is called Coimbra in our collection. It is 50 centimeters in diameter, 10 kilograms of, of brass, and we don't know who was the maker. Uh, it is a Portuguese simplified version of the planispheric astrolabe that you know. Pilots and sailors, could calculate the latitude of the ship by measuring the height of the sun at midday. The Elidad, which is part of the astrolabe, crossed by a beam of light, measured the angle. This was checked directly in declination tables for the date to give the latitude. Uh, the ta this table shows the Mariner's Astrolabe's world catalogue in 2017. They were over 100, most recovered from shipwrecks. You can see number 9, that was found in the Tagus River, and also number 18, the ones with the circles, that is our Coimbra Astrolabe. And you see that the Coimbra is twice the size, no? the average size is 70 to 25 centimeters. These large astrolabes were made of wood, and they, would, well, they could be also taken on board, but they were to make accurate measurements on land and they did it, Vasco da Gama took one when he was on the way to India. So our instrument is a sort of a brass model, maybe for a teaching purpose, but the meaning remains. 
and the use of these marine astronomical instruments enabled ocean navigation in the South Atlantic and beyond, and also, of course, circumnavigation. Pedro Nunes, our mathematician, is the genius who established in the 16th century the science behind navigation, the Rumb line or Loxodrome, and the principles to make the New World's map that was uh, the Mercator projection. Portuguese maps were practical navigation charts to be used on board. They ended up wildly dispersed. Uh, the 1502 planisphere, from an unknown Portuguese author, was smuggled to Italy and is today known as the Cantino planisphere. And the exploration of these lands includes many places where the Portuguese arrived. They started with the Madeira Islands in 1419 and they ended up in Tanegashima in Japan in 1542. Some of these places, of course, became occupied and became territories and colonies of Portugal. The focus on the colonies was on the wealth, wealthiest territories. Brazil, Amazonia were considered a paradise on earth. The new lands needed hard labor to complement enslaved indigenous people. Enslaved African people's roots were established to provide this new workforce. So Lisbon became the most global city in the 16th century. You can see on this painting, it is one of the busiest commercial streets of Lisbon that portrays different diverse types of people. 10% of the city population was Africa in the 16th century. Decolonization movements uh, intended the creation of a museum of discoveries or enslaved peoples, but it was dropped in 2018. Instead, Lisbon museums developed exhibitions on this subject. The City Museum published this guide, a historical guide to an African Lisbon. And in 2019, an Afro-Descendants Association proposed a public memorial for the square, the slave market in Lisbon by an Angolan artist, and the implementation is under boycott in the city council. So I'm going to move to Fabio now. Yeah. So at the observatory, uh, there is an important collection of maps uh, of Brazil. Uh, therefore, the following topics will focus on the colonization of Brazil. And so um, even Mariana in his presentation will also focus in Brazil. So the Portuguese arrived in Brazil in the 1500s. Uh, establishing their initial domain over the coastal areas. In the 18th century, with the development of new instruments and techniques, and also driven by the desire of exploring the territory, natural resources, uh, the Portuguese expanded their control over the interior, interior areas of Brazil. Uh, it also, in the 18th century, that surveying and cartography became an uh, important part of the colonization process, because it allowed it to fully understand the territory uh, in terms of uh, um, of topography, uh, hydrography, fauna and flora. So we also chose some objects that were uh, being used as a reference for this type of approach, including also the plane table Elidad, that was one of the important measurement instruments that was used for uh, ground uh, uh, measurements. Uh, here we have different techniques that were used, that used the, the, the plane table Elidad as a reference. Uh, even for performing this uh, triangulation and radiation uh, methods. Uh, then, uh, of course, that uh, the survey takes uh, uh, became very important uh, to the to establish the, the the outside borders of Brazil, but also to create some limits inside Brazil. Uh, on the map on the left side, it is possible to see the Tordesillas meridian that was established in 1494 when Portugal and Spain divided the world into parts for each one uh, to conquer. Uh, it, also, it is also possible to see that meridian in the other map uh, working as a border and thus preventing the Portuguese to move further west. Uh, it also uh, visible the way that the latitude was used as a reference to establish the limits between the administration areas within Brazil. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, a new group of professionals, uh, the military engineers, replaced cosmographers and mat mat mathematicians in the task of surveying. Uh, alongside them, there were also Jesuits, astronomers, performing this type of tasks. Uh, the information obtained from those works were of high importance to organize the territories and define also uh, defense strategies. Uh, the philosophical voyages were scientific expeditions that took place in the 18th century, sponsored by the Portuguese crown. Uh, their goal was to study and gather information, uh, objects and specimens to send to Portugal. Uh, going upstream, upstream the Amazonian River, 
For example, the main ex uh, expedition was the one that was made by Alexandre Ferreira. Uh, he was also able to explore areas that were unreachable by land. Uh, as part of the expedition team, there were also military engineers uh, for surveying purpose, of course. And then rivers were being used as roads, and that led to the creation of important hydrographic charts. Uh, but, of course, this is just one side of the story, so Mariana will tell you the other part. Well, so, um, as mentioned by my colleague previously, the Astronomical Observatory of Coimbra holds a large collection of maps that includes the result from the result from exploratory work as it is as, at its previous colonies such as South America, and the room is currently uh, in a remodelation process. Now um, I will also focus on the maps of South America, most specifically from Brazil, and to talk about this case and how can maps contribute to imperialistic narratives even to this day. I bring this map from Brazil done by the Portuguese engineer Antonio Pires Ponte de Leme in 1797. He spent nine years in Brazil uh, researching and uh, to do this map. Now, um, this map was actually um, exhibited uh, in the Laboratory of the World Exhibition at Pinacoteca de São Paulo in 2004. And back then, the exhibition program would mention the work of engineers, Jesuits, and Bandeirantes, which were called explorers, as a combination of knowledge derived from mathematics, astronomy, and fine arts. And uh, this idea can also be seen in contemporary literature all in Brazil and also Portugal. Now, but what about the indigenous people? Active uh, between this concept of science and progress propagated by the lights and the literature about map making, there seems to be something missing that we must address, especially if considering the whole of the University of Coimbra on the colonialism. You know, uh, for example, there would be lack of universities in colonial Brazil because uh, there could no exist any universities there. Also, academic training would belong usually to the University of Coimbra. Also, uh, therefore, we must talk about the active role of indigenous peoples in the elaboration of maps concerning the recognition of the topography. Now, if we considered maps as means of representation reflect the interests and objectives of those who propose them, we can reaccess those artifacts and propose new interpretation con interpretations considering that. Well, again, those ideas contribute to the imperialistic values and the dualism, savage versus civilized, that was previously re referred by uh, many uh, writers such as Fanon and, for example, Dan Hicks. Uh, now, uh, I bring this case study of the map of Goiás from 1779. Uh, now, at the 18th century, uh, the Portuguese, they started their expansion towards the interior of Brazil. And uh, that was considered uh, important for the Portuguese crown to validate the possession of the territory. Now, uh, we have this map from the 18th century, which differs from the one from the 16th century. Now, uh, this is again the example of Capitania de Goiás. This map uh, could be a good example because there has been a lot of research on the indigenous communities who were previously in that area and helped with the uh, process of map making. Now, uh, nowadays it's the state of Goiás uh, and also, the interesting part of this specific area and the interior of Brazil is that uh, those places were and still are occupied by numerous indigenous peoples from different language families, such as Je, Bantu, and groups such as Kayapó do Sul, Arwen, uh, Chavante, Carajá, uh, Xerente, Avaca Noeiro, and others, uh, who are actually still being mapped to this day and also still suffer a lot from the remains of the occupation and colonial imperialism. Now, uh, according to a recent publication from Brazilian Geography Society magazine, indigenous culture was assimilated by engineers and Jesuits and explorers while map making. Now, the interior, or the Sertão, was organized, mediated, delimited, and settled to fulfill the objectives of the European dominators amidst the look of gold, medicines, and other materials that could be profitable. While the indigenous communities were affected by diseases brought by the Portuguese, were engaged in slave work, had the territories invaded, and many times were coerced into helping in territory making. Now, uh, to the final thoughts, uh, I will... Okay, uh, then... 
We actually aim to uh, reassess the collection, bearing in mind possible connections to the past colonial environments that allow a decolonial decolonizing approach and also to focus on the museum as an object as a mediator within a network that connects the tangible and intangible also to present different voices including those of indigenous peoples who suffered inequalities and prejudice from the western world uh, now to include the actual role of indigenous peoples in the activity of map making and to promote co-curation or try to promote co-curation of exhibitions with the collaboration of indigenous peoples and communities who participated in the elaboration of the historical materials. Now, uh, this is something that already has been happening. For example, there is an exhibition uh, in Brazil uh, that it's itinerant, so it's been uh, going around Brazil that actually brings uh, the work of artists, for example, from uh, indigenous communities and other uh, marginalized communities from Brazil um, that uh, get involved in the curation of the exhibition. Now, that would be it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You did so well that we have some time for questions. Um, I could think of a couple of questions, but maybe there are questions from you. Does anyone feel the need to... Or I can... No, well... well <laughs> I... keep, it sh keep it short, though. Okay, about the map making. I mean, we have similar issues in India, right? About map mapping, and how do you bring together indigenous ideas of representation of the land, if you want to call it a map, and that. But there's obviously a problem of the sources, right? Like, and I think a big, a big question is here, how, how can we be more inventive also on the methodological side to bring these things together and bring up the voices of the indigenous people about their representation of the land and how that went together with the mapping of the Portuguese. I don't know whether you have, because it's a big challenge, obviously, here. Well, I think, uh, thanks, thanks, Roland. I think you are right, it's not an easy issue to tackle. What our idea was to raise the issues and to have a little bit of wishful thinking that we can prepare these ideas, and when is the opportunity we can get them and try to gather these people. I think we can invite the indigenous to come. Of course, they are not anymore, they are out of date in terms of uh, re realization, but they can bring their art and they can bring their ideas that stayed in the communities to try to make a connection to our productions. You mentioned India, yes, we also have mappings from India and the Portuguese were in Goa, the Maui view as well, but uh, the, the question is that this time was the 16th century, it was much earlier, in India was about the same, but the territory of Brazil is enormous. You know, it's 44% of South America. So it's quite massive in terms of a little country, Portugal wanted to get half of America and fight with the Spanish to keep their part. Even when we had a Spanish crown, Brazil grew up. So it's not easy at all, but I think this suggestion of uh, Mariana about this art, maybe it's a starting point. It's so I don't know, Mariana, you want to answer anything? Uh no, I think uh, it's uh, quite hard, uh, but we do have, um, I'm from Brazil, uh, by the way, and we do have in Brazil uh, a lot of activism uh, from indigenous communities in different states. So uh, to access them and to maybe do this, uh, this start, this kicking point uh, can be, um, well, it will be hard, but uh, it can be at least a starting point, I believe. At least to do the connection, uh, it's uh, easier, and then we can start from this point. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, Silke? Thank you very much. Two hugely fascinating talks. I've got two very brief questions. One for Neil. Um, you said this wasn't done by university academics, but it was done by the museum. My, 
I mean, one could debate that, but my, my question really is, what's the long-term impact? Is this going to go back? Is this going to feed into the curriculum? Is there a request from students that that is part of what they're being taught? Um, and for the Coimbra group, um, are you aware that we are organizing a um, couple of sessions at the Scientific Instrument Commission meeting in Palermo on decolonizing astronomical collection? I hadn't got my papers with me, otherwise I would have checked. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the university has a separate exercise going on about decolonizing the curriculum. So this will lead into that. We've got to be really careful that what, you know, we're not claiming more than we are with this exhibition. This was looking at the legacies of slavery today. Um, it's, and yes, you can associate that with a broader decolonization. And it's decolonizing the, decolonizing the curriculum rather than decolonizing the university which is a much bigger challenge because, you know, if it hadn't been for slavery, we wouldn't have had the Industrial Revolution. We wouldn't have had the enormous wealth and privilege that there is in Western Europe. And the University of Aberdeen wouldn't be trading on being 527 years, wherever it is, without that legacy. So, you know, we are deeply dependent on that legacy. So it's, it, it will come out in teaching, it will come out in exhibitions, you know, it, the rethinking the curriculum, rethinking how we relate to students. And one of the, the big issues I think we have is the, the makeup of the collection reflects the historical connections between Aberdeen and the rest of the world. So you see the British Empire. Um, the international makeup of people in Aberdeen today has different dynamics. So there are very few people in Aberdeen who have uh, an ancestry in the Caribbean um, who've got that history of slavery in their personal um, life stories and family stories. What we do have, however, is a lot of people from West Africa, particularly Ghana and Nigeria. So how do we relate with them? So it, it opens up hugely rich areas that you know, will change the teaching that's happening, will change the way that we work with the students. But um, hopefully on Monday, the university will consider this report that we've, we're asking for various actions that are about long-term change way beyond an exhibition. Is there time for one last? I have one question. <laughs> um, no one is nodding yes or no, so I'll just go ahead. Um, I find the, the thinking about maps as colonial or from a colonial context really very fascinating and interesting also because we've been discussing that, that in the Netherlands uh, the last couple of months or years and we started off actually talking about how it was maybe even stolen knowledge as you know the opposite of stolen goods and um, especially when maps are not printed but, but in manuscripts discussing whether they might not be well, we're not really speaking of restitution, but we're also thinking about how to, because it's part of um, knowledge that's not over there from our perspective, but over here. And I guess that's a question for you, for all of you, if you would, um, how, how you feel about that. Can you repeat, please, Esther, because it makes a strange. Oh, sorry. Well, I think my, my basically my question is, should we think of these kinds of objects like maps, especially as uh, could we call them stolen knowledge, like we speak of stolen goods? Um, is, is, would that be fruitful at all? I don't know. And um, how can we maybe give back that knowledge? Well, yeah, I, I can answer that. Well, uh, in this case, I don't consider it a stolen good. The, the information is stolen, of course, and the construction because we were illegally occupying the indigenous people's places without considering their perspectives. However, this map exists also in Brazil. So in terms of restitution, I think that's not a point here. The point is really to include the people that were totally excluded from the process. And that's our idea was... Also talk about when there's a collection. Yes, please. When there's maybe a unique map, like a manuscript map. That's, that's the, the category I'm thinking about. Yeah. Uh, in this case, we made sure that all these maps that we have, there is a duplicate, even original almost, because they were drawn by hand in Brazil in this case. So uh, that question doesn't put, but I think if it's a unique, a unique map, you'd think about restitution for sure. In some ways, you must follow that path. Please. Uh, 
Uh, I would just like to add one more thing. It's about um, restitution. Um, as said, I, and I will quote Laura Jane Smith last, uh, on her last presentation, is that restitution is not only about giving it back, though it's important too, but in many cases it's all about also uh, considering the narrative of the artifacts inside the museums or in heritage, because heritage uh, can be also... Um, a way to spread imperialistic narratives and it's important to have attention to these things especially nowadays that we face uh the rising of many uh different narratives uh and uh, extremism and so therefore i think that it's also about the narratives and how the artifacts can in the museum be put together in a way to create some kind of narrative that can be very uh very dangerous uh i believe yeah, and I think the you know you, you're not getting me talking about repatriation today, which for me is a, a wonderful relief. Um, and I don't think s s the history of slavery in Aberdeen and the Northeast didn't result in you know particular collections of things that people want back. It's money, it's privilege, it's power that came. And I'd actually be really worried if we did try to focus on returning something as a that'll solve the problem we can carry on with what we've been doing anyway because we've dealt with it so i think it's just where restitution is a more interesting word but there's a lot more than that it's actually about you know it's about our normal day-to-day -day existence it's so embedded in what we're doing it's not a a special thing you do sometimes it's just it's who we are it's what our legacy is so i think it's going to be a, it's a huge thing and it's just going to be business as usual for forever um, I think this uh, should be the end of this discussion, but thank you very much. And uh, Thanks. Thanks. Great. Who's next? <laughs> okay. I think you really have to speak into this. Well, it is working. No. Yeah, it, really? Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Natalia. I'm from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow and uh, welcome to the second part of the session dedicated to experiencing difficult heritage. Uh, so in this part of the session, we will have the opportunity to uh, discuss and reflect on the possible and effective methodologies of uh, communicating difficult heritage. Uh, what we mean by possible and effective? Uh, I guess that we mean uh, integrative, reflective, inclusive, perhaps. We shall see. Uh, we have two interesting presentations ahead, two interesting cases. Um, let's hope that we will begin a discussion regarding bringing out the multi-dimensional aspects that stands behind the adjective difficult in difficult heritage. So I am very excited to open this part of the session and invite our first uh, speaker. Uh, it's Anne uh, Dulauf Beveridge from the University of Glasgow. And I'd like to shortly introduce our speaker, if I may. Uh, well, Anne is from the University of Glasgow. She's art curator and a specialist in late 18 um, British and French art. Please uh, join us. The floor is yours. Right. I might need some help in finding the presentation. I can't, can I see it? Oh, I've got it. Sorry, it's talking too soon. Um, so now, if only I could read Polish, <laughs> that would help me. Slides, oh, slideshow, is that right? Are we there? Perfect. Um, well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, really, as you were saying, this presentation within the Experiencing Difficult Heritage session is built on uh, reflections around a five-year research project on the memorialization of Mary Queen of Scots, 
arguably the most famous and controversial figure in Scottish history, that was followed by an exhibition celebrating the afterlife of the Queen. So Mary Queen of Scots is known as a beautiful, charismatic 16th century queen whose dramatic life is a staff of legend. And I, I won't go into details here, but you know, there's murders, there's rapes, there's abductions, there is miscarriage, um, and all sorts of other events have marked her life. Um, and all, and, but what one needs to remember, I suppose, is the fact that she was forced to abdicate her crown, age 27, spent the next 20 years in prison, and eventually ended up being executed by her cousin, the Elizabeth I of England. And all those events were taking uh, place against the backdrop of European wars of religion, debates around gender prerogatives, and questions around the nature of monarchy. From the moment Mary was forced to abdicate, rival accounts of her life and character emerged and played an important role within these intertwined contemporary debates. Um, and uh, she has been um, named many names, and over the centuries she has been portrayed in countless different ways uh, to support many causes and perspectives. Um, and here you have some of them, you know, from Mary the Innocent to Mary the Murderess, Mary the Mother of the Nation to Mary the Tyrant Adulteress, Mary the Catholic Martyr to Mary the Heretic, etc., etc. So what of the research project on her memorialization? Well, the Hunterian is home to an important collection of Scottish art, including among its star items, a painting, The Abdication of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, by Gavin Hamilton. It's one of the most reproduced paintings in the collections, and the first of many history paintings depicting an episode of Mary's life. It was commissioned in 1765, roughly 200 years after her abdication. So you can see how important she was 200 years after her life to Scottish people anyway. Um, the project began in 2015 with a coffee and this painting when I invited the Dr. Stephen Reed, who has been really influential throughout the whole project and that I still work with really closely, um, who's a lecturer within the Department of Modern History at the university, to discuss my ideas for a small in-focus exhibition around the abdication of Mary Queen of Scots that would look at its making and meaning. But we noticed very soon when we started chatting about what we could do with the painting, we realized that there was much more that could be done and that Glasgow had a lot of untapped material relating to Mary produced over the centuries. Um, so when, once we realized that, and here is a slide that gives you an idea of the range of work that we found, and I would really stress um, the um, rare books in special collection were particularly important because within more than a thousand items was lying um, the memorialization of Mary really and it was accompanied many times with illustration that gave a visual to that so that was really uh, precious and we decided to um, invite a range of colleagues from within the university from academics to student interns as well as colleagues within uh, the museum the Hunterian and uh, librarians and archivists within the university as well to try and explore that material and make sense of it and see what we could do with it. That initial exploration led to a two-year network research project and our plan was to investigate with the help of over 40 academics and colleagues uh, at, with the University of Glasgow, including uh, cultural institutions such as the National Museum of Scotland and other places like that and other university, um, to consider how Mary has been remembered. Um, and we did that through a series of six workshops, initially due to take place physically, with a maximum of 10 to 15 contributors each, who would all be expert in one area or another. Our primary aim was to explore Mary's posthumous reputation and depiction in popular culture from the end of her personal reign in Scotland to the present day. And this, we hoped, would help us to begin to lay out what the changing representations of Mary tell us about evolving attitudes to gender, monarchy, and religion, as well as Scotland's perception of its own history. Little did we know that within the next few years, uh, we were going to have to deal with a worldwide pandemic, the swelling of social movements such as Me Too and Black Lives Matters, which came half in play halfway into the project. Um, and all the players in this evolution were the major shifts in the role of museums that have accelerated in the last three years concerning inclusivity, community participation, and power imbalance. Like many other cultural institutions, the Hunterian is now prioritizing the reframing of the interpretation of the collections to one, 
make it more relevant to today's society, and two, move on from the imperialist and colonialist agendas once embedded in the creation of many Western museums. In September 2020, it appointed a curator of discomfort, Vandra Yeoman, to address historic imbalances within the museum and across all our activities. In practice, this means engaging with difficult heritage and the role of museums in facilitating and encouraging debates on the nature of that difficult heritage and experimenting with new models and narratives around the collection as part of our daily life. I can tell you it's a challenge and it's really not easy um, at times, but it's also very rewarding. Um, resulting amendments to the project have been challenging but positive. How? Well, during COVID, the concept of physical workshops were abandoned and we transferred the remaining sessions online, opening them up to the public. Suddenly, the discussions originally planned for small groups of experts were available to many more, and feedback from the public began shaping how the project and the answering exhibition developed. Um, I'll give you an example here. The first of these online seminars focused on the challenge of presenting objects associated with Mary whose provenance are often dubious. Everybody likes to think they have a, his, a piece of Mary and there are countless shoes and um, um, purses. She must have been a very careful woman if you believe what you can find in private and public collections of that nature associated with her, for example. Um, one case study was a harp, a key object in the National Museums of Scotland, purchased at auction in 1904. Later in the history of the museum, this association was deemed questionable and references to Mary in the label were dropped. But to this day, visitors still come and ask to see Mary's harp. This led us to consider the fact that objects associated with historical figures have multiple meanings, dependent on where they come from, who is seeing them, and within what context, and to ask questions such as, how then should a museum engage with a multiplicity of meanings for objects associated with historical figures? How should tensions between audience expectation and assumption, um, sorry, between audience expectation and assumptions or past and current scholarship be negotiated alongside the due acknowledgement of the ambiguities of ownership and provenance? How important is authenticity in the presentation of these objects in a museum context? And how might changing cultural and historical contexts affect understanding of authenticity of the historical truth of authentic objects. Now is not the time to consider these questions, but for those of you interested, these and more have become the subject of a chapter by the curator of the early modern period at the National Museum of Scotland, Dr. Anna Groundwater, to be published towards the end of 2023 in a collection of essays inspired by the project and these kind of questions. I raise these questions here because they symbolize the moment we realized how topical our project was becoming and how we might use Mary to tackle some of the difficult questions museums were starting to consider around past interpretation of history by, for example, opening up discussions on the nature of truth with our colleagues and audiences. Much more came of these online seminars and we were able to turn them into blog resources on the project's website with nearly 40 contributions from network members examining everything from early Mayan engravings to waxworks feminist plays, drag representations of Mary, etc., etc., And it brought, led to more questions as well. Um, another aspect of the project that was very useful in terms of uh, continuing to think around all those questions was a free massive open online course on Mary that was put out by the University of Glasgow, which Stephen Reed, my colleague on this project, has been involved with. And it was built around a series of short films and interviews with carefully devised questions that punctuated the course to evalu evaluate what the students had taken on board and to encourage them to reflect on what the countless conflicting, emotionally charged and sometimes enigmatic depictions of Mary over the centuries tell us about our society and what she means to us today. And I've just put a very few a snapshot of some of the responses we got and I chose them purposefully not too uh, positive so you can see the kind of reaction that we got with there can be many Marys as long as mine is the right one or, you know, all I remember is uh, the importance of walking where Mary had trod or um, all that they wanted was to, uh, for her to remain the dignified mystical martyr who had transcended history. Or, you know, it's okay for other people to have an opinion, but for me, 
um, those different Marys don't represent the Mary as I have conceived her in my head. And we used um, all this um, data from um, the responses to the course to help us um, build an exhibition um, and to choose the themes that we would um, uh, go for. And, and this is what we decided to go for, the questions around authenticity, emotion and empathy, memory and myth, and that idea of multiple uh, Marys. Um, and briefly, the exhibition was about bringing to life a selection of objects related to Mary Colonel Scott's in the university's collection that stretched over 500 centuries. And we used stories connected to those themes um, to build the exhibition. Um, and um, it was uh, divided in three parts. Again, really briefly, the first part was about the bare facts on Mary's life because we felt that not everybody will know who she was and we just wanted people to have an idea of uh, who she was with just facts. And then in the second room, from power to romance, we explored her afterlife from several angles, politics, religion, and gender history, and then considered how when her importance for political and religious debates diminished, histories of England and Scotland began to reinterpret her story according to the sensibilities of their age. The highlight was the painting you saw at the beginning, the abdication of Mary Queen of Scots, um, because it marks her shift from a historical character to a romantic heroine. And the last room, Iconic Mary, focused on the 21st century and on the way that mass media via film, TV, the internet and social media has dramatically reshaped Mary as a 21st century icon. And it's also stressed how her image had been used to comment on a variety of issues at the heart of contemporary society and culture, from sectarianism to nationalism, race and gender to queer identity. What came out loud and clear out of this project overall for me and others was the potential use of the approach we developed to refresh our understanding of other iconical historical characters. And this leads me to the final part of that talk, touching on how we could reframe our approach to historical figures, reframe the ways that we, present, we represent our past, aiming for a better, more holistic understanding of the society we live in. From a practical point of view, that will come as no surprise, it boils down to time and to the importance of embedding an inclusive collaborative process from start to finish. We would never have been able to work on that project in the way we did if we hadn't had so much input from so many different um, perspectives at, from the very onset of the project. Um, and as a university museum curator, I'm aware of the need to involve academic colleagues and students to showcase their research. But I'm increasingly thinking to widen involvement from others further afield, as well as within our own organization. Without this involvement, projects cannot really become a forum for conversation, for constructive questioning, um, and that really what is making the difference. From an intellectual point of view, the acknowledgement of several, several and I've put understanding, because I didn't know what to call those, but you hopefully will understand what I mean when I use understanding, were very helpful when reframing Mary. I've picked four of the more relevant when dealing with difficult heritage in general and put them on your screen. So there is the ambiguity of stance that writers can take when discussing history. And I think particularly with Mary, um, it was really interesting to realize that in a process showing surprising parallels with 18th century developments in historical criticism, the retelling of Mary's story in the 20th, 21st century, while incorporating novel material approaches and perspectives, had until relatively recently remained constrained by established views of what history should be and by whom it should be practiced. There was also the importance of provenance when dealing with museum objects that invariably leads to questions around authenticity, truth, and mismaking. And the capacity of certain objects to generate strong evocative responses in those who engage with them, often at the direct expense of acknowledging their highly contested provenance and past itineraries. And then there's a tension between entertaining and educating in museums that resulted in the creation of many myths. Um, so these all point ultimately to the relationship between heritage, identity, and material culture. Out of these understandings came questions. Um, and again, I'm just giving you a few to give you a flavor of what we were trying to get our head around. Um, so, how should museums, for example, celebrate the entangled nature 
of available information rather than trying to sort out the true from the false. Um, how should we uh, stress that whatever angle a museum ends up choosing, the interpretation it goes for is never a fully finished story. How should we acknowledge that the visitor's own perception is just as valid as our own, regardless of how non-specialist the visitor is? And how or should we shift from a traditional role as educator to that of facilitator? I have to say, when I embarked on that project, I, I had no idea I would end up asking myself those questions. And, and today, five years down the line, my answer would be yes to most of them, if not actually all of them. Um, that approach, those questions leading to yet more questions are what led us to reframe a national icon who is also a controversial figure, and all nations have at least one of those, through the study of her afterlife. Exploring within our cultural institutions evolving attitudes to material culture and locations associated with a historical figure, and reflecting on the way it places... Oh, I've lost my... It, on the way its place in communal memory is often shaped by emotion and supposition rather than a critical evaluation of its life and reign, opens up discussions and provides a refreshing way to approach myths, legends, contentious, contentious reputations, traumatizing events, etc., difficult heritage in general, I suppose. In other words, telling the story not of a person, object, or place but rather as that of attitudes towards them, as Sharon MacDonald from the Institute of European Ethnology in Berlin has done so efficiently in her study of how Nuremberg has negotiated its Nazi, Nazi past. I'm also aware of what we did not do. Um, for example, Mary's role in perpetuating an uh, imperial identity in British colonies and the retelling of Mary's story in relation to race are topics that require attention. Involving local communities wasn't really easy either. We've got a lot of work to do there, and I'm really interested to try and find ways of doing that um, in the future, but in its time. Um, one final thought, motivated by discussions with Andrea Yeoman, curator of discomfort at the Hunterian. There is a time and place for hands-on confrontation and another for realization. Not everyone has to tackle hands-on the difficult heritage linked to legacies of the empire legacies of the empire and power imbalance currently at the forefront of our minds. What we can do is help our audiences and readers to become more aware of the many narratives in existence, inexplicably, ine inescapably meanings invested in objects change over time, and stress that there cannot ever be only one authoritative narratives. Making this clear to our audiences would help bring about a more nuanced understanding of our past and present, and encourage, facilitate that debate around our heritage, which is what cultural institutions, such as museums and universities, are all about. As the old saying goes, if you do what you always did, you get what you always got. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, uh, very illuminating and interesting approach to explaining us a bit how, how difficult the, uh, the adjective is and we usually pass on just calling, calling it difficult heritage and it's actually very fragile because it touches very uh, delicate and controversial issues that are built within our societies. So uh, thank you for that and we will of course have the discussion later on after the second presentation. Let me now invite uh, Teresa Wernerowa-Wolna from the Academy of Art, Architecture and Design in Prague. She is an art curator and art historian. She's currently working on modern university insignia, visual representation of academic rituals and site-specific art at university campuses. And her presentation will be about images of technology and science at Central European University campuses after 1945. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I think I will take it uh, to my hand, maybe. Uh, well, first I will try to find my presentation here. Good. And uh, well, the very first thing I wanted to th thank you, uh, the board uh, of this conference to having me here because it was it is a big delight and a big honor to be speaking here. I'll try to start the presentation right away. 
And also, I'm very sorry, my uh, PowerPoint presentation had a different resolution than the uh, projector, so some of the artworks I'll be showing might be a little deformed by that. I hope you'll get to see at least a little bit of it. Well, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Teresa Wernerová Volna. I'm currently finishing my PhD at the Academy of Art, Architecture and Design in Prague, Czech Republic. And in the past half a year, I was uh, researching the artworks that were created for the technical universities and faculties in Central Europe after 1945. And in fact, you might be <coughs> asking why such a peculiar topic came to my mind. Um, I was asking myself this question, question in the half, ha past half a year myself, mostly mad at myself. But in the beginning there was a question, how is uh, art reflecting science and technology? What visual language does it use? Or do the artists try to explain some scientific phenomena? Or do they, tr uh, of, or do they see the science as some kind of mysterious parallel world they can hardly ever understand? I soon found out uh, that the university sites are great places to research such ideas because works of art that were created specifically for them intentionally reflect the topics and ideas of scientific and in this case technological research. The aim uh, of this presentation uh, is to explain visual strategies and reflections of scientific topics. And in the end, I would like to uh, offer a little thought on how the institutions deal with this type of heritage. I decided to co compare the examples from former Czechoslovakia, Poland, and also former uh, German Democratic Republic. The difficult political context uh, of this region will stay a little bit in the background in this presentation, but I will get more into more details in the article I'm uh, preparing on this topic as well. Uh, the decision to focus on the works of art at technical universities was based on the fact that the technical and technological research underwent a, underwent a great uh, development in the second half of the 20th century. The focus of the scientists uh, became more and more complex, uh, more narrowly specialized, and also more and more distant from the imagination of people, non-scientists and non-experts. Further construction uh, boom also resulted in many uh, commissions of works of arts for the universities. The first, the first strategy I look uh, into is uh, the identification of science with a person of a scientist, which is closely uh, linked to the 1950s and the socialist realism. Here we can observe a quartet of electrical engineers uh, on a relief by Otakar Walter above the main entrance of the building of former Univers University of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering in Plzeň, Czech Republic. We can compare this scene to a similar one that can be found on a wall of student dormitories of Technische Universität in Dresden. These four engineers in the code labs in Pilsen are set in a dynamic composition and, face, and their faces even communicate different emotions. On the, other hand, on the other hand, the scientists in very similar lab coats in Dresden represent more predictable universalist uh, social realistic stiffness and lack of individuality. Even the props, in this case, are uh, more predictably universally scientific. A microscope, laboratory glass, and a big sheet of paper that we associate with technical drawings. Well, why was the persona of a scientist and, ingen scientist and engineer particularly important for the visualization of science and technology in the 1950s? Czech historian Dobravka Olšáková notes the ambivalent position of intellectuals towards people and uh, to the idea of Communist Party. According to Olšáková, a scientist has to go through re-education or rather self-education and should finally hand over his or her results to the society. However, the attempt to the, of, the, of the party to re-educate uh, the intellectuals failed and the role of a scientist as, a, as an impersonation of science vanished from the picture uh, in the end of 1950s. However, we can find more ideological thoughts communicated in art in the 1950s. Technological research was supposed to contribute to the realization to the realization of new 
and advanced environment that was in direct opposition to wild, unmanaged and unused nature. It was based on the idea that, and I quote Olshakova again, the new socialist men should live in a new socialist environment, which was to become the technosphere. End of quotation. In this relief, uh, relief by uh, at Recknagelsbau by Wilhelm Landgraf clearly refers to the dichotomy of the natural world and engineered landscape. On one side, the author de depicted symbolically developing a uh, world of higher organisms, starting with a dinosaur over to shellfish and fish up to a roaring mammal. On the other side, he uh, schematically organized the achievements of technical progress in idealized picture of a world dominated, dominated by technology. A different position can be seen in Max Lachnitz's relief at Merkelbau, uh, once again at the Technische Universität in Dresden. The depiction plays with the socialist, socialist effort to create a new man fully fused with technology. The figures of undefined gender merge with decoratively schematized devices that refer to thermodynamics. On one side, the figures examine the technical components, components, but on the other side, you can see that they uh, are formed and permitted by them, as if the author, in the spirit of science fiction, was suggesting that the human existence is no longer possible without the machines. Lachnit's second uh, relief lacks human figures altogether. It shows a cross-section of thermodynamic devices, but it is not a functional scheme. The simplified turbines are composed as a purely decorative element and reflect the beauty of thermodynamics in perfect proportions. The strategy to upgrade parts of machines to decorative elements also appears uh, in uh, space dividers in the entrance uh, area of the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at Czech Technical University uh, in Prague. The composition, united by black-brown color, refers to techno-optimism and aesthetic idealization of objects, appearing in the visual arts, at least, since the Machine Art Exhibition uh, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1934. Together with the curator of the ex exhibition, Philip Johnson, we can assume who else would appreciate the aesthetics of a turbine or a benzo more than students of engineering. To address another important topic, uh, symbols, of, uh, uh, symbols associated with uh, cosmonautics, space exploration and research can be found in the decoration of public spaces and including universities, especially in 1960s and 1970s. They were related to the official rhetoric of uh, the space race, which was used both by uh, the Western and Eastern countries to, as a symbol of technological progress. Some historians, like uh, John A. Douglas uh, in American context or Jaroslav Holta in Czech, con Czech context, even see the direct link between uh, the launch of the first satellite Sputnik in October 1957, the following space race, and the expansion and reorganization of the universities, uh, both in the USA, Western Europe, but also uh, the um, Soviet bloc countries. One of the most monumental works referring to the theme of a space is exterior mosaic uh, for the auditorium in the University of Zielena Gora, Poland by Polish artist, artist uh, Viktor Cichacz in cooperation with Henryk Krakowiak. An enormous portrait of Yuri Gagarin in astronaut's helmet, as you can see, uh, stands out from the abstract geometric motif. The effort to realistically capture his face contrasts absurdly with uh, the abstract form. It is no coincidence that the composition of uh, concentric circles visually refers to Nicolas Copernicus' uh, texts on a revolution of heavenly spheres. Originally, Czechach's inspiration was really based on Copernicus' idea of the heliocentric system. But Krakowiak later recalled that the idea to add Gagarin's portrait 
came from the management of the school to remind the Gagarin's visit of the school in 1961. We can compare Chichard's mosaic to another famous uh, piece of art uh, made by Stefan Knapp for Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun in 1972. This work of art also refers to Copernicus's uh, key text, but uh, the story of the artwork is rather atypical itself. All the previous and the following examples I'm showing, uh, uh, or actually, this one is the only one from the examples I'm showing that is made by an artist living in emigration. Uh, Knapp, back then living in Great Britain, visited Poland in uh, the early 70s and also got to Toruń, where the um, building of uh, the new sites of the campus of Nikolaus Copernicus uh, University just began. When he got back to Britain, he offered to the university to make a mosaic for the Ola of the, uh, of the university and donate it to Nikolaus Copernicus University. There, were, there was no political pressure for him to include political symbolism, as the university and the Ministry of Education were quite delight delighted by the fact that they were getting a piece of art for free. I don't want you to think that the cosmic teams were exclusively appearing in Poland in connection to Copernicus, hence I mention some uh, more examples from Slovakia. Here you can see the campus of the Slovak Technology, University of Technology uh, in Bratislava and also a sculpture in the University of Technology in Kosice, both from 60s and 70s. However, in the Czechoslovakian context, the cosmic teams were even more popular in decoration of elementary and secondary schools. Some artists also in, have intentionally taken uh, works of art as a medium to use it almost as an educational tool. Instead of books or lectures, they use creative means such as color, spatial composition and scale. In some cases, the, the objects can resemble scientific illustration or even data design. But unlike these disciplines, maximum accuracy, objectivity and impartiality are not the main criteria. This very illustrative approach can in fact be seen at the work by Reinhold Langner and his students. Another very fascinating example can be found again uh, at the Rectangelbau in Dresden. There, the sculpture Magdalena Kressner referred to two opposing approaches that have historically uh, explained the theory of light transmission. On one side, you can see uh, the depiction of wave theory, which interprets light as a wave. And the, on the opposite uh, side, you can see uh, the depiction of corpuscular theory, which interprets light as a particle. The spatial opposition of the reliefs co copies the intellectual opposition of both theories. Kressner dealt with, dealt with the complicated topic with artistic sensitivity and without the tendency to be overly descriptive. That was rather rare in, the public sp in art in public space in 1950s. Czech sculptor uh, Tomáš Medek uh, since 1990s continuously studied structures and transferred them into sculptural objects. It is also the case of this uh, of this example where he worked with the uh, molecule of adamantan. Uh, it was a chemical that was used to uh, cancer drugs in the 1990s. In his concept, Medek strives for faithful visual visualization of the bonds of this molecule, which are artistically impressive themselves. And perhaps the most comprehensive of all artistic visualizations of scientific principles ex ex is exhibited at the Technical University in Dresden. Jenner's instil installation by Roland Furman consists of 1,500 borosilicate glass tubes that are uh, layered in 11 layers above each other. This, and I quote the artist, impressionist painting in space, end of quotation, uh, systematically visualized the principle principle of spectral analysis of chemical elements. 
The relatively complicated principle of spectral analysis turned into monumental installation offers the viewer almost a physical experience of this research procedure. Mm -hmm. Coming to the end, in the previous examples, I suggested how some of the works of art uh, situated in campuses of technical universities can be read. But uh, there is a question how this could be useful for the institutions. I believe that the first step is to successfully deal uh, with the heritage, is to understand it. Well, I'm not sure if understanding is what we see here at the campus of the Czech Technical University. <clears throat> but some of the universities I communicated with, and among all I have to mention uh, once again the Technische Universität in Dresden as a bright example, uh, focus undeniable amount of energy to study, present and take a good care of their works of art. University museums have been recently established in Toruń or at the Technical University in Ostrava. Also, some other institutions uh, financially support mapping and presenting art artworks in the campuses. One good example is the project Hmotnost, uh, supported by Czech Technical University, that created interactive map that uh, shows or uh, even finds some forgotten artworks in the campus. Other universities still have some way to go. It made me actually very sad to hear that uh, some of the artworks got lost during reconstruction, just as in case of Košice, where there uh, reportedly were some interesting reliefs uh, with technical motives, but uh, are not anymore. And uh, what's more, there isn't even a functional archive of the university to, be, uh, to, to find the original pictures of these reliefs. On the other hand, at some places, uh, I sense a genuine effort to uh, deal with this challenge. Uh, I asked the Slovak uh, Technical University in Bratislava if they have some uh, list of the artworks, and they replied that, they, that there is no list, but, this, um, but my question would actually be a good opportunity to create one. Well, a few months later they are still working on the list, but I believe it's a good beginning. In my presentation, I was offering insight in the works of art that were created in the past 70 years. As you can imagine, some of them are clearly uh, getting to the point where they will need serious restoration. Here on the picture you can see beautiful columns painted by Hermann Glockner in Dresden that hopefully will undergo renovation soon. But finding funding for any renovation can be difficult. Uh, on the other hand, understanding what the, what the work of art is saying about the scientific fields and how it constitutes uh, identity of the institution could bring key arguments to the debate. Mapping, presenting and preserving the works of art in university campuses is one step that needs to be done. But in my opinion, for the sustainable practice, there is next complementary step. The institutions also need to have the strategy uh, for the present and future acquisitions of artworks. They, in fact, have to ask questions. What type of art are we interested in? What should be the occasion for obtaining it? Should it be construction of a new building or should we uh, per periodically uh, acquire artworks? What is the funding uh, there? What are the processes of, changing, of, of choosing the works? Should we have open uh, committees? Should we acquire the artworks from the artists working for the university? Or should we uh, support local or regional artists? And most importantly, they need to ask the question, what message should the art pieces uh, send about the institution? Well, I wish you all working for the universities to have the energy and the support to reach to the stage and answer all these questions successfully. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this very interesting presentation and also thank you for being uh, very uh, specific about, about time. Uh, please stay because uh, we will have the, the time for discussion. I'd like to invite also the previous speaker, uh, Angela Beveridge. Uh, so we can open uh, the discussion now. Are there any questions to our speakers regarding the topics that were, um, that were presented?
Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to thank you once again for a very interesting uh, and very illuminating uh, presentations. And I'd like to also make my own comments. Thank you, especially for that uh, contextualizing of the meaning of difficult heritage. Uh, I think it's, uh, you use the metaphor of the window, and I think it's, it's quite illustrative how these issues lead us to some problems that we have in the society. Maybe not necessarily problems, but very fragile, sensitive, controversial issues that have to correspond. And when we deal with difficult heritage, we have to find a way to communicate with these issues that are part of the way society is, is built. So I think that this is very uh, important. Uh, reflection that we may have uh, in 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 result of this uh, of this discussion. So I guess that the issue of awareness is what comes with it. Um, awareness of of these um, of these issues that accompany uh, what uh, causes con contention or or tension in in our societies. So, are there any questions? Yes, the afternoon session uh, is, has its disadvantages regarded to the, the time and the weather also. Yes, there is one question, please. Um, question, my question is um, about your project. Uh, would you be interested in um, work um, with another uh, cities and architecture and, for example, this kind of um, um, research um, to, to check the narration of universities, not only about this architecture from um, 60s, 70s or 50s, but maybe Middle Ages and uh, this temporary. Because we started uh, at the Agelonian with one of uh, um, projects about narrations and we uh, focused on not only text about uh, exhibitions, but about different aspects and also um, about architecture that we don't have any more because they were sold, destroyed, or but it's also how the, 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 the way how we communicate about the past and the place where we are now. So it would be interesting to 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 discuss this uh, in broader context and to ask you for maybe uh, coordinate some group um, of that for much more of um, interest person, I, th I think. And uh, both presentations were really great because they show us from how different perspectives we can be focused on heritage, on difficulties, and even if we are in different situations, in different mentalities, we every time we find uh, similarities. And this kind of similarities and differences help us better to understand where we are and what we uh, should be looking for. Yeah? So uh, it was great. And uh, yes, I will wait for <laughs> working group or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, thank you for your question or the comment. Yes, I would be very interested. Uh, in fact, uh, this project that I was presenting is just a brief overview of uh, the research I, I had half a year to do, so there was not much time. And uh, as I realized, the problem is way bigger and uh, way over a half a year of uh, work of art historians. So I hope I will have a chance to uh, follow deeper or further, maybe in time or maybe also in the genre of the um, relationship between science and art. So yes, yes, I'm very open to any collaboration and I think uh, that's not the end of my research, or I hope it's not uh, the end of my research in connection between science and art. I have one more question to, to Anna regarding um, the principle of inclusion, <laughs> which is the immediate response when we deal with problematic issues that require uh, or demand uh, a more uh, inclusive approach, which means give, um, uh, give the floor for, for the people to speak up, to allow the plurality of voices to, to come out. But then comes the, the question of how to build something common from all the plurality of voices. You mentioned the referendum and you mentioned the, the, the chaos that arises once we uh, allow everybody just to, to speak. So where do we go from there and how to um, manage uh, this, this diversity that arises? No, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's a very 
Yeah, uh, having worked on that project around Mary Knopfskotz, I'm really interested to look at the historical collections of the university and um, look at um, art history as well. Uh, again, I would probably contain myself to Scotland in particular because if you open the gate, it just becomes far too much. But the question for me is going to be how to integrate our local communities more. And uh, what I'm learning uh, as we are trying to find ways of engaging with those communities, that besides the question of trust, there is also starting small. I think if we try and start too big, we are not going to go anywhere. We just, pilot projects are all the rage at the moment, but they really have goodness in them in the sense that they can be as small and delicate as you want them to be or as big as you want them to be. And, you know, a, sm a small bite at a time is probably the best way to try and get to work with involving communities because that's not something that museums have done before it's not something that universities have done before necessarily either so it's a change of attitude and until we've embedded a different way of working in how we work i think all we can do is just start small and and hope for the best and and hope that people will come along on that journey with us and not be arrogant um uh, thank you very much. Um, so, to, to conclude this session, it had an ambitious title, Experiencing Difficult Heritage. I'm sure that we cannot solve it uh, all, all at once, so I propose to move discussions uh, further to uh, less professional and formal uh, channels. Thank you very much, and we move to the next uh, part of the, uh, the programme. I should pass the microphone to Natalie, right? So, you hear me? Yes, I'm very proud to welcome four of my students from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, they are actually at, in the last year of their courses because they are in Master 2 in Cultural Management. And she, no day, will talk about their project. So you should know. I say, là, oui. No, no plus haut. À droite, à droite. Marek, where is Marek? He has left. Hubert, we need help for Polish, please. Full screen, you see. Okay, so the floor is yours. Okay. So I have to add that we thank, of course, the, the Polish Association of University Museums because they are taking in charge the accommodation for the students. And I uh, thanks to Universum, of course, and also the ULB because the travel are in, um, taken in charge by the, the university. So, Sarah. 
thank you. Um, so yeah, we are presenting now our book. Uh, the book is the Proceedings of the Universium Conference uh, of 2022. Um, the conference took, uh, took um, place in Belgium last year from um, July 3rd to July 8th. So uh, we are a group of six students, like Madame Mrs. Nist uh, said, from uh, the Master of Cultural Management of the ULB. Um, we came together around this project to uh, publish um, scientific content based on the um, papers and posters presented at the conference, conference last year. So um, myself, uh, Deborah and myself, we uh, contacted the authors and uh, had contact with the uh, proofreaders. Um, Laura, she did more the uh, communication part around the book. Um, Nin had more contact with uh, the graphic designer. Caroline made uh, our budget, and uh, with that handled uh, the proof, uh, the, the rereading of, of the book. So um, the publication of the conference, conference proceedings is uh, a um, is a culmination of a long process that began uh, one year ago. Um, three of us uh, took part to the to the organization of the conference last year. And uh, this experience uh, allowed us to acquire tools in um, the organization of uh, inter-university and international events. And after that, with the help of Mrs. Nist and with the help of uh, three other students, we embarked on the path of uh, publishing a book. And I will let Caroline explain you the content of the book and also the process, the process of uh, making the book. Thank you. Uh, so just like Fedra said, uh, this book is the proceedings of the annual conference that took, uh, that took place last year in Belgium. So uh, it was uh, co-organized by ULB and KU Leuven. Uh, and the conference traveled uh, in different Belgian cities. So we had, of course, Brussels, we had Mons, Leuven and Ghent. So the first thing that we wanted to do in this book was to highlight uh, the diverse Belgian uh, univer uh, university museums and collection. So we had uh, each university um, present their collection and it's uh, quite interesting to, to see in one place uh, the diversity of point of views regarding matters such as uh, scientific culture, highlighting the heritage, um, the discussion, so sparking new discussion with the public and also the relation between knowledge, the students, and the museum. So uh, that's the first, part, the first part of the book. Second, uh, we obviously uh, present the points that were discussed during the conference. So responsibility of the past and, and the challenge facing university heritage, um, the accessibility of scientific culture, and um, the, sorry, <laughs> and um, uh, the production of knowledge within the museum structures. So um, each author here will deepen the, the point that they discussed in the conference. So it's, uh, it's a lot more dense. Um, the, third, uh, the third part of the book is actually a report uh, of the results of the workshop that was held uh, at ULB, so around the research of provenance of colonial specimens from scientific collection at ULB. And finally, the posters are also included uh, in uh, the book with a commentary from uh, their respective authors. So, uh, yes, now I will talk about the process of making uh, this this thing. <laughs> so uh, we started by obviously taking contact with the, with the speakers to find authors. Uh, we also communicated our editorial guidelines and uh, thankfully we got responses. So uh, then uh, we, had, uh, we had to have feedback from a scientific committee. Uh, those, uh, this is actually uh, from uh, its members are from Universum uh, Network, so they gave us feedback, we got final text from the authors, and the task to start editing those texts uh, was uh, then uh, there. So we had a great deal of 
uh, unification and uh, a lot of back and forth uh, between uh, us and Mrs. Nist. Um, finally, uh, Mrs. Nist and Mr. Mrs. Nicole Geshe uh, Koning uh, proofread the last, uh, last time. Uh, and then we entrusted the layouts to uh, a graphic designer, sorry, <laughs> a graphic designer uh, who we, we worked very closely with. So we had our, our, our work printed out uh, around three weeks ago. And uh, yes, we chose the printer according to criteria and, uh, and uh, some standards that we had discussed, of course. Uh, and yes, so that's the um, that's the step to make to to have uh, this this book. Uh, we also, in parallel, had a budget that we had to adapt uh, through all the, this process. And uh, there there is a last step that Laura will talk about uh, about a wider accessibility. So I'll, I'll give it the word to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um First, we would like to thank uh, every authors who participated uh, for this work, and it was a big honor for us. We would like to thank our teacher and our project manager, Mrs. Nist. And we would like, of course, to thank uh, our printer, AZ Print, who, who took a, a lot of her, his time to answer to our him, a lot of emails and to print it, our book. And we would like to give a special thank for creative communication, our graphic designer, Muriel, and her husband, Jean-Pierre, who make um, an awesome job. Uh, we would like to thank, of course, Universium to give us a chance to, pub to do this work and to publish this work and to inviting us today to presenting uh, our project. It's and an, um, it's awesome, it's a very big honor. And now we invite you to, to consult uh, the link or to scan the QR code. And you can, because our book is now free and available online on the museum website, net, on the museum network website. Thank you for listening and thank you so much for all. For having us. For having us, yeah. oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Just a quick word to thank you very much for all your work. It's very impressive. I don't think we've seen proceedings being there exactly a year later in a long time. Since Padua, you said? Yeah, so congratulations for that. And it's actually a great idea to have you do this as a project where I, it seems like you've learned a lot about making a book, which is also great. So uh, maybe we can uh, keep this as a format. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted that the book is here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So we have we have print some uh, samples of the book for the authors, of course, you can have it free for free on the website of the ULB Museums Network. Okay. Thank you. Now, now we come to the session which we've all been waiting for, which is the poster session, because it's the only session where you can have coffee and, <laughs> and look at the posters. Uh, and as we have been doing uh, for many years, uh, we, are, uh, we have a chaired poster session. That will mean I will just introduce very quickly all the authors of the posters, but very briefly. And then we can go, and I think it's, it's a great idea because that will also avoid creating a, a, a queue at the coffee machine. Some of you can already go to the, co uh, to the posters, others can grab the coffee first, depending on what your priority is, right? Like, and then we can have the poster session, which is also great because we're running a little bit late in time. Uh, so great for this. So I would like to int uh, introduce the first poster, which is uh, Alexandra uh, Jakowska. Alexandra, you're here? Yeah, please come up here. University Museums, Cultural and Social Functions, How to Measure the Effects. A few words about evaluation of universities, and uh, you are from the University of... My Polish is very bad. But, <laughs> you can say it yourself. Uh, Bydgotsk? 
Bydgoszcz. Bydgoszcz. Uh, okay, hello, my name is Ola. I'm from Museum of Polish Diplomacy and Refugees, or Immigration, from Kazimierz Wielki University. And my poster is about uh, heritage, about responsibility, and about influence. And I ask if we, it, it is possible to measure the impact of in university museums on society. It's an open question, and I can answer it. <laughs> okay. okay, if you're interested in more, please come to the poster. So then we have another poster with a lot of authors, but I know to the two Julias are here because I met them. Julia Castagnetti and Julia uh, Ferrari. Who are, yeah, please come up here. And then we also have Matilda Algassi, Elisa Bini, Frederico Marzi, Margarita Monica, and Margarita Sacchero, but they're not here, right? Uh, so the, the title of the poster is A Physical and Digital Accessibility Project at the Centro Studio de Archivo della Comunicazione. My pronunciation is not very Italian. At the University of Parma, and obviously they're from the University of Parma. They told me they're not, even though it says PhD students, they're not PhD students. So you can say a couple of words. Okay. Good evening, everybody. We, it's a, a pleasure for us uh, to be here. It's uh, the first time for our institution, Centro Studi Archivio della Comunicazione. Our post is about a um, research uh, we made in this couple of years. So we hope you enjoy our results and our methods. Okay, thank you. So we go to the next one. An uh, Gustafsson from the Karolinska Institute, uh, from uh, the Medical History and Heritage Group uh, from Stockholm. And her paper is Lost and Found, the, repatri the Repatriation of Christina Larsdottar. Okay, thank you. Uh, my poster is about Christina Lars Dotter. Uh, she was a very famous person in her time in the 19th century. She had a, a growth disorder that made her over two meters long or tall. And she traveled around the world in Sami clothes, exhibiting herself. And when she died, her, belong her remains were brought to Karolinska Institute, where she was exhibited in the museum. And after a fire, we thought her belongings had disappeared. But uh, last spring, I found a part of her belongings. So now we are making this uh, repatriation process to Malo, where she came from, in the north of Sweden. OK, thank you. Thanks again. So please, if you're interested in, come to the poster and talk to, uh, to Anna. And now we have uh, Yedretse, who I met, but again, your name is uh, uh, Situya and uh, Tadeos Dobests and the secret of preserving the color of wet specimens, a preliminary report. So if you want to know the solution to that or like you want to have the secret uh, uh, lifted, right, like you have to come to see the poster. Yes. Uh, good morning, my name is Jędrzej uh, Siuta. Uh, I would like to present uh, the short preliminary report uh, about the secret of preserving of the color of the wet specimens. Wet specimens are of course the fragments of the organic tissue put to the preserving liquids. Uh, and of course we can observe that during the years uh, most of the wet specimens are fading, so losing the colors. More or less depends from the type of the preserving liquid used in them. And some of the specimens keep the color, even although they are very old. And uh, we checked it and we found out that the um, substance which is uh, important to preserve the color is the glycerol. Later we make also oh, the... You, you shouldn't give the secret. Please, people have to come for your poster. <laughs> ah, so, okay, so I will stop now because it's only half of the secret. So the rest will be on the poster. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you have to stay because you have a second poster, yeah. right? Uh, with some other authors. And also you're from the Department of Forensic Medicine from the Wroclaw Medical University, right? And the second one is X-ray imaging. imaging as a method of examining wet museum uh, preparations presenting human body injuries. And again, very interesting, I read your abstract. It's about bullets. Yes, it's about bullets in the tissue. Uh, generally, of course, the uh, X-ray imaging is well known in the museology, but it was mostly used to the dry 
uh, proper rice, for example, the mummies and so on. Uh, if it was used to the wet proper rice, it was uh, were typically taken out from the fluids for this. This time uh, we made uh, the examination through the jars and through the fluids uh, to check, uh, make a confrontation between the description of uh, that what was on one uh, jar and the proper rice inside. So you will see on the poster what this is about. Uh, and. Uh, the main clue is that this uh, X-ray examination works very nicely through the liquids and through the jars. There are some important things we need to, to check making this, but of course more will be on the poster, so I invite you to, to see it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we have Elena uh, Corradini with her, uh, with her team, with uh, Gaspare Bagheri and uh, Sara Uboldi, but it's only you who is here, right? So Elena, please. Uh, and Elena is, uh, the poster is between science and art, narrating births with two collections of 18th century uh, obstetrical sculptures to enhance visitors' well-being. And uh, yeah, you are from uh, the University of Modena and Regia e Emilia. Yeah. Uh, uh, my research aims to investigate uh, in depth the relationship between uh, university cultural heritage and the people well being and health. In particular, a relevant uh, part of uh, our research uh, aims now to evaluate the social and uh, cultural impact of uh, obstetrical models, not only in our uh, museum in Modena, but also in uh, the models by the same author in uh, National Museum of Sanitary Art in Rome. Uh, uh, in, uh, fruition on adults with uh, acquired disabilities. We are complaining, uh, complaining with uh, these adults, uh, cultural path and then realize uh, creative activities and uh, measure the returns how these uh, activities can uh, improve their creativity, health, wellness, and so on. At, at the least, we are realizing a master about cultural heritage and well-being with the medical, uh, with the medicine of our university to create a new, with the um, political authority in our region, to improve a new uh, professional uh, uh, figure about these activities. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. So we come to the next poster, which is Penepole Tilogi Gauti and Ioannis uh, Ilopouris and Nicola Kuguya. Uh, sorry about the names. <laughs> uh, uh, the Greeks, Gakes. Hmm? My name is very simple. I'm Penelope. Penep Penelope. Penelope. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. But some of the other names, obviously, I wanted to read out the names. Communication, reflection, and academic knowledge sharing through uh, innovative models of co creation in the Science and Technology Museum, University of Patras, Greece. So you're from the University of Patras, Greece. Yes. So uh, I will be happy to talk about you and to share our experience to work with students, university students and how we connect the three levels of education, primary, secondary, and the university education, and how we co-create uh, activities, educational activities with students in order to popularize science and to make, to support the, the uh, collaboration between the university and society. Thank you. Okay, so we come to the next. Uh, this goes here very, very fast. Uh, Adola Cevic, Aldona Cevica, uh, Cevica. I'm very sorry. As somebody should be Polish, should be standing here. Joanna uh, Gugul and uh, Olga. Uh, yeah, uh, just, yeah, Olga Czuska, Yeah, you can come up here. Yeah, uh, student culture in Bygdost in the 1970s, preservation of heritage, and you are also from the... Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, we, pre we, prepared, okay. we prepared a poster about student culture. Um, the period is uh, from 16th to 18th 
Mm, and it's uh, various things actually. Uh, we made a product project uh, about it um, and finished in April, and it was all mm, different documents about student culture in our region. Um, and consisted um, of um, different uh, pictures, um, almanacs, chronicles, documentation um, about um, a student's culture, uh, which is um, music uh, festivals, uh, jazz festivals especially, theatres, cabarets, uh, different activities actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy. Yes, and if you want to know more, come to the poster. Don't, don't tell everything here. Okay, so the next one, pioneers, researchers, leaders, women scientists of Gdansk, uh, which is Marta. Uh, you can read that. Yeah. <laughs> the authors are uh, Marta Szaszkiewicz and Magdalena Jaszcza. On behalf of the authors, I would like you to, to see this poster that is present the uh, exhibition uh, uh, dedicated to the leaders, uh, leaders, researchers and pioneers, the female who made the Gdansk science and research the best in Gdańsk. Okay, great, Marek. This was obviously Marek. Okay, thanks a lot. And I think from the Josephinum, the new Josephinum, they're not here, right? I haven't seen the poster. Okay, so this poster is not here. So we come to Lea uh, Lepic. Uh, Lea, where are you? And looking for a balance between sharing knowledge and entertainment or how to sell a 19th century physics cabinet. Couple of sentences, very short. Yeah. Uh, Okay, from the University of Tartu. Uh, we uh, made a cabinet of physics, newly, new exhibition about it, but uh, the problem was uh, that uh, we have very valuable instruments, but uh, they are not all looking uh, very attractive. So the most problem, how to, how to show it, and, uh, and uh, the second problem, how much can I speak about old physical ideas? For me, as a historian, this is very interesting, but I cannot teach it to school children. So, and the solution you can see on our poster. Thank you. Yes, so please come the po to the poster for the solution. And we have Janika Andersen and uh, Ken Eert. Yeah, Janika is coming uh, from the University of Tartu uh, also. Uh, I, f I think I forgot that. Uh, art or science, preliminary work, research and output. Hello everybody, uh, the most important information about my poster is the last uh, visitor of my poster will be awarded with a book. It's a beautiful um, bilingual book about science and art. Uh, and our project was huge um, cooperation between Estonian Art Museum and the Estonian Art uh, um, Academy. And we concentrated on uh, visualization materials of science and uh, uh, teaching, like uh, wall charts, models, drawings, and also erased uh, different difficult questions. You're welcome. Thank you very much. So if, you're, if you want to have the book, please don't be shy. Rosa Nan. Uh, Leumbach from the uh, Department of History and Technology of the Technical University of Denmark, who has a poster and experiencing technical academic heritage in art and architecture, a meeting between knowledge and cultures. Yeah, Rosa. Thank you. Uh, my poster, very short, is about how we have uh, collaborated with the artists and architectures of the university to find space for the collection on campus. Great. Short. And if you want to know more, please come to see the posters. Now we have Carsten Heck from the uh, student engagement uh, uh, with his papers uh, or with his poster student engagement uh, at the Forum Wissen from the Forum Wissen of the University of Göttingen. Here, Carsten. Thanks a lot and hello to everybody. Um, my poster was inspired by um, the visit of a colleague, Maciej, from, um, from Krakow, uh, who found it very impressive uh, when he was in Göttingen to see um, how we uh, collaborate with students on campus. So what I did was I did a short survey and a workshop with our students, and we came up with four personas that portray four different types of student engagement and collaboration at Forum Wissen, which is a seminar student, um, a communicator, um, a student assistant, and also an intern. Um, so come and see the poster and we can discuss these personas. Thank you very much, Carsten. So Anna Zubek, uh, adapting specialized content for an audience, a guide, a guide's perspective. Uh, she's from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, 
uh, hello. I am from the Nature Education uh, Center, which is basically a natural history museum, and I hope to see a lot of you there on Sunday. And as for the poster, um, I just wanted to show you what happens if you let a non-specialist interpret and explain a highly specialized scientific content to a very diverse group of audience. Okay, thank you very much. And last but not least, obviously, it's uh, Joanna um, Slaga and Natalia Bav uh, Balvanan uh, from the Jagiellonian uh, University as well. University collections post and during conflict. Uh, reconciling difficult heritage proposal for the uh, cooperation. Please, a few words about your poster. Yeah, and we are in a bigger group with Ursula bonchuk davidjuk and Ursula Rospara and we worked on this also with Svitlana Morawska and we invite you with this poster to uh, cooperation and to uh, wide discussion about uh, heritage, tangible and intangible, especially tangible in transit, in transition um, because and due to different situations, due to conflict situations, not only wars, but sometimes local ethic, ethnical religion uh, conflicts. Uh, as uh, Krakow, uh, Lvov and Lviv and Wrocław, we have this uh, experience that we need, needed to move after wars, for example, or different uh, dividing times uh, when Poland was divided and and we needed to start again and to to use different places to readapt them to um, refresh and and to narrate the stories uh, this East European perspective is really important but we want to compare this East European perspective with other cases. So please see our poster to join us. And in the workshop group, Difficult Heritage, uh, provided by Universeum, we want to talk more and more about this topic and reflect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, an applause to everybody. <laughs> And uh, uh, I just wanted to collect like all the things. I wanted to collect all the applauses also. And now we can grab a cup of coffee and see the posters.